The Monsters That Made Us is brought to you by the Cage Club Podcast Network. For all things movies, music, media, monsters, and more, head on over to cageclub.me. That's cageclub.me. Today we're heading back to the desert sands of Egypt, where some well-meaning folks have once again meddled with the mystical forces beyond their control. Librarian and aspiring Egyptologist Evelyn E.V. Carnahan and her brother Jonathan and adventurer Rick O'Connell have discovered a map to Hamanaptra, the city of the dead, which they believe to be a treasure trove of priceless artifacts, including the Book of Amun-Ra. It also happens to be the final resting place of the disgraced high priest Imhotep, who centuries ago was buried alive for having an affair with the pharaoh's mistress. Racing against a rival expedition and ignoring the warnings of the mysterious Ardith Bay, Evie unwittingly awakens Imhotep, unleashing a fury of biblical proportions. Can our heroes locate the Book of Amun-Ra and send the immortal Imhotep back to the underworld before he can sacrifice Evie and resurrect his long-lost lover? Join us as we descend into ancient Egyptian tombs in search of the mummy. To a new world of gods and monsters. Listen to them. Children of the night. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! I killed a wolf, a plain, ordinary wolf. By studying these and other species, we add to our knowledge of how life evolved, how it adapted itself to this world. He went for a little walk. He could his face. Welcome to the return of The Monsters That Made Us, the podcast where we celebrate the spooktacular characters and films in the Universal Studios Classic Monster series. Today we'll be discussing the iconic 1999 adventure film, The Mummy. I'm the invisible Dan Colon, and joining me as always is my co-host who is practically an amateur Egyptologist at this point, Monster Mike Manzi. Dan, your strength gives me strength. Good to be here. Yeah, it's a big one, right? I didn't expect to have our second episode be such a, you know, a huge movie, yeah. but here we are. 20 years after Frank Langella graced the big screen as Count Dracula, and now Universal, two decades later, is finally taking another stab at one of their classic monsters. Reimagined as a big-budget action-adventure flick with elements of horror and comedy, The Mummy opened in the spring of 1999, what many consider to be one of the greatest movie years ever, and has since gone on to become one of the most iconic and beloved films to come out of the 90s, appealing not just to us old school monster fans, but to just about everybody, it seems. Indeed, it was so successful, it spawned two sequels, a spin-off franchise, a short-lived animated series, and an incredible theme park ride. But the road to the mummy is kind of a long one with lots of twists and turns, and we'll get into all that could have been. But first, this is the first movie that we actually could have seen in a theater during its original theatrical release. So, I have to ask, Mike, where were you in 1999? Did you see The Mummy? And what are your thoughts on it now, viewing it in this context? Okay, wow, taking it back. So in 1999, I was working at Bennigan's as a waiter. (laughs) I had graduated high school by then, and I unfortunately did not see The Mummy in theaters. However, I went over to my friend who was a co-worker's house with some other people from work and we all watched it or around his television on vhs and i remember loving it like i was i was riveted you know i had a big screen tv there was a bunch of us watching it like it was it was a good time and i was very surprised i gotta be honest this wasn't kind of my thing in 1999 i guess the matrix appealed more to me at that point you know sure. uh, i was in like the mummy was just not on my radar and i wouldn't have thought it would have worked as like a giant blockbuster either you know i was thinking the mummy i think sort of more subdued mystery or romance or something like that and and like we get that stuff here but it's all under the facade of like a great big spielbergian independence day banner and it's crazy how well it works and i had a great time revisiting it i haven't seen this movie in in years uh shame on me and uh, (laughs) i i whipped out the only copy i had which was on vhs 
I popped that in and I had a blast watching it again. Like it was fun to watch the effects, like the effects blended so well with the distortion of a VHS copy that like, I was like, oh, this is great. I was like, these effects, they're seamless on VHS. I would like to rewatch it in nice, pristine 1080p or 4K or whatever uh, also. But I was just saying like, this was a lot of fun. I can't believe this is like the first movie after Dracula. That was a major gap. It's worth the wait, but what a wait. And here we are. I was 12 when this came out or going to be 12. So I didn't see it in the theater. I saw a different movie that month, but I didn't see it in the theater. And I'm sure I caught it not long after when it came to HBO, probably watched it a bunch then. For whatever reason, it didn't click in my mind that this was like a reimagining of the original Universal Mummy. It doesn't look at all like the same sort of movie. It's entirely different. However, as I got older and I started to pay attention to the details of this, I'm like, oh, okay, Imhotep, this is the exact same story, but they've just switched up the genre. So at 12 years old, I wasn't really like into movies like that yet. By the time I did, when I was sort of like in high school coming into college. Unfortunately, this sort of big studio blockbuster action movie was kind of beneath me as I kind of became a film snob, right? Yeah. I, I kind of didn't go back to this for a long time. And then I think I graduated and a bunch of people were like, we love The Mummy. It's a great movie. And I'm like, really? The one from 1999? The one with Brendan Fraser? That's awesome. And so I rewatched it as an adult. And, you know, of course, I fell in love with it. It's been a while for me, too. I, I haven't really watched it for a little while before recording tonight but it holds up so well I, I love a lot of the effects work it's like a mix of practical effects and cgi which was like cutting edge at the time i love the spirit of this movie just kind of taking this original story this imhotep and angsunam and forbidden romance kind of thing and then like we've talked about before these characters really hold up under different kinds of genres and different types of storytelling and um yeah this is proof positive of that 100 percent yeah, yeah, like that's the thing that blew my mind is after going through the original run and being so familiarized with the mummy and the and all the different cults and all the different names and everything like that to be like, wow, it's it's all here. Yeah. Like they fit everything in and not ev not just everything from the first movie, but there's stuff from like sequels. They took all the stuff that worked. Steven Summers, we'll talk more about him, but like you could definitely feel that he knew his stuff. Like he grew up with this stuff and he was like, no, this will work. We'll just, like you say, like switch the genre. Like we'll make it an action mummy movie this time. And he had such a great vision for this. And it just feels like one of those like eureka moments where everything like kismet, like it all kind of came together. And like, you would never have thought the mummy could be great big giant action movie but like here we are and it works so well what blows my mind is just how so many people love this movie right mm. it wasn't just like a successful you know reimagining of the 1932 mummy it like transcended the horror genre and became this like enormous franchise it's one of those things that like you know as a fan of this material as a fan of the characters the fact that it's so beloved by so many people makes me really happy it's a perfect movie yeah it's on that other level now too because there are so so many kinds of movies like this back in the 90s and and before and after you know just like this blockbuster thing but it, it kind of it goes along with the monster stuff but it also falls into like oh if you like twister or like as independence day or like uh, like it almost plays like an Irwin Allen disaster film at times. Like you see old, like with all the practical effects and all of the giant sets and all of that kind of widescreen action stuff. So like it kind of crosses the quadrant more than you would assume, you know, this is going for like that four quadrant audience and like hits every box without being condescending or annoying. Yeah, it does have everything, right? It's got action, it's got some romance, it's got comedy and horror. And it's spinning all those plates so effortlessly. It's such a perfect blend of all of that. It's really hard to do, to sort of satisfy all those different things, those elements. But Stephen Summers makes it look effortless here. And that, I think, is maybe the most impressive thing. Yeah, man. Okay, so let's get into it here. As I mentioned, the road to the mummy was really long and there's a lot of different characters and a lot of things that, you know, like this movie could have been one of several different things. One of the most interesting things I discovered about this movie, I didn't realize that it actually started late in the 80s. Back in the late 80s, the idea of first updating the original 1932 mummy was first conceived by two men who are going to come up a lot this season. It's James Jacks and Sean Daniel. Now, I had not been familiar with these guys before, but they are responsible for pretty much 
the entire Mummy uh, extended franchise. James Jax was a Wall Street financial analyst who had decided one day to become a screenwriter. And then when that didn't pan out for him, he became head of production at Circle Films in the early to mid 1980s before becoming the senior vice president of production at Universal in the late 80s. So somewhere in this time, he had produced Raising Arizona for 20th Century Fox. All right. I gotta say, just being on the Cage Club Network, that being a flagship show, like, all right, I'm already on board. I could see the pedigree. <laughs> yes. You want to talk about pedigree? Sean Daniel had been at Universal since 1976, working as a film production executive. And in 1985, at the age of 34 years old, he became the youngest production president in the studio's history. During his five-year tenure in this role, he oversaw the production of a ton of iconic films, including Animal House, The Blues Brothers, Breakfast Club, 16 Candles, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, Field of Dreams, Do the Right Thing, Back to the Future, and I Could go on and on, but we don't have time. When Jackson and Daniel pitched their mummy idea to Universal, the studio gave them the green light to produce it on the condition that they keep the budget around $10 million. Okay, so now let's get into the sort of different things this movie could have been. Yeah, are you mean like different versions this went through, you know? Like, oh, yes. there's, there's like great books out there about movies that never got made, or I think it's like Tales from Development Hell. There's like a couple volumes of that. And like I, being a huge Godzilla fan, I know there was a lot of this going on in the 80s and 90s before the Roland Emmerich Godzilla came out. So I'm always fascinated about this stuff. And so I need to know like the road to this mummy. Most of the different ideas that floated around for a while don't really resemble the finished film. You'll, you'll kind of see how it gets closer at one point, but most of them are just these wild ideas from people we know. So as early as 1987, Jackson Daniel had a treatment written by George A. Romero. Oh, no kidding. Oh, all right. Yeah, we, we talked a lot about the mummy is like a zombie. Yeah, and he was actually attached to direct the film. Screenwriter Abby Bernstein was tasked with expanding Romero's treatment into a full screenplay. As she remembers it, the studio was looking for a mummy that was like an unstoppable force, like the Terminator. Her script set in modern day involved scientists accidentally resurrecting the mummy who was then hell-bent on using some ancient weapon to destroy the world. According to Bernstein, quote, the mummy had no more social interaction than the T-Rex did in Jurassic Park, end quote. Romero ultimately left the project and then this script was completely abandoned. Jackson Daniel then approached filmmaker and writer Clive Barker. Nice, okay. Barker's dark and violent treatment was expanded into a screenplay by Mick Garris. Oh, okay. Again, a lot of familiar your names. Yes. This idea uh, involved an art museum that rebuilt an entire Egyptian tomb in Beverly Hills. And the mummy in this one was more of a jumping off point than a central character. Surprising no one, Barker's concept was, quote, dark, sexual, and filled with mysticism, end quote, according to James Jacks, and that, quote, it would have been a great low-budget movie, end quote. So, so far, none of the none of the grandeur. They're, they're, they're going small here, small scale. Yeah, well, remember, they have to keep it under 10 million. Yeah. Yeah, what can you do? To do it in modern day would definitely help keep that cost down. Also, surprising no one, Barker believed that his version was, uh, quote, too weird for the studio. Although there is still some Clive Barker stuff with this mummy having to be like walking around with no flesh and stuff. It's very Hellraiser. You could see the connections. The um, regeneration definitely right. has a Hellraiser aspect to it. Yeah, I, I agree. So next in line was screenwriter Alan Ormsby, who at this time had worked with Bob Clark on Children Shouldn't Play With Dead Things, Death Dream, and Porky's 2 the next day. <laughs> is quite a triple feature. Yeah, he also worked on uh, Paul Schrader's 1982 remake of Cat People. He's got some horror credibility here. His mummy script was pretty straightforward, keeping with the idea of a Terminator-esque mummy. Attached to the direct was none other than Joe Dante. Oh, cool. He wanted to increase the budget, of course. And get this, he wanted to cast Daniel Day-Lewis as the mummy. Oh, I, I could actually see that, you know, especially if the mummy is going to be verbal. If you get something like the original one, that was involved where he's walking around with the fez and, and he's trying to you know do business and everything i can see daniel day lewis as a karloff type but i have a hard time imagining him ever saying yes to this project so the script which was rewritten by john sales was also set in modern times oh well wow, right it was written by john sales who did like a lot of horror he wrote alligator Right. And he wrote Piranha. Like he did a lot of horror before he became an indie darling. So there's another Joe Dante connection. You know, oh, maybe, OK. Maybe, yeah. yeah. Maybe Joe was like, hey, take a look at this. 
Yep. So Sales's script was also set in modern times, and it incorporated familiar reincarnation and love story elements, as well as the flesh-eating scarabs. So we're getting closer to what we ended up with. Now, this version supposedly came very close to being made, but Universal balked at the higher budget. By 1994, Jackson Daniel got George Romero back, and this time Romero had envisioned more of a zombie-style film about a female archaeologist named Helen Grover who discovered the tomb of Imhotep. This story took place in the modern day United States where some rays from an MRI scan awakened Imhotep inside a forensic archeology span lab. And then while Helen experiences clairvoyant flashbacks to a previous life as a priestess of Isis, Imhotep resurrects the mummy Karis to exact revenge on those who robbed his tomb. Okay, it sounds a little convoluted and like they might be running around a hospital too much, but I would still have faith in seeing like a third act of a lot of mummy being commanded Mm -hmm. you know in a in a very fun sort of romero style yeah i like the concept of the heroine that's nice and i guess bringing it to america may i could maybe he wanted to do it in like new york or los angeles or something that can always raise the budget too much now this script was considered too violent by the studio and the two producers no romero was also unable to get out of a contract he had with mgm and so he again had to bow out of this project okay i was thinking about the violence we'll talk more about it later but it's wild how they get away with so much like conceptually in here is twisted and horrifying but oh for sure and it's like so easy to watch and they do such a weird trick with that toning down the violence to getting things through but also it's still being like you know very twisted and disturbing Yeah, totally. Now, Mick Garris also came back to the project. All right. In 1995, he envisioned an Art Deco-style period film that combined elements from the original 1932 Mummy with the 1942 The Mummy's Tomb. I could see him wanting to do this as like a miniseries because he's good at that kind of stuff, right? Didn't he do like The Stand and other Stephen King-type television? Yeah, he did a bunch of stuff. None of it was ever hugely popular except for Hocus Pocus. That's probably his most successful screenwriting credit. But everything else was, you know, lower budget, less successful stuff. But he's been around the block a bunch of times. He knows his stuff. Critters 2 is perfect. I just got <laughs> So he was combining The Mummy with 1942's The Mummy's Tomb, which I definitely see in this finished film. Like we talked about sort of how they combined elements. And I think The Mummy's Tomb, for sure, in the sequences where Imhotep is tracking down those who opened up that case under the the statue of Isis. They read the curse and, you know, he comes after each of those guys. This script was deemed too expensive due largely to its period setting and was updated to a more modern setting. And the project did actually get close to being made. However, that same year, Universal was acquired by Seagram when it bought a controlling interest in MCA. Sid Sheinberg, then president and CEO of MCA and Universal, decided to produce The Mummy independently with a new script, but was unable to find a suitable writer and director. And so the project fell apart again. Again, fun fact, around this time, Wes Craven was offered the project, but decided to turn it down. Would have loved to have seen that version. Undeterred, Universal was still determined to bring the mummy to life. And in 1996, they hired screenwriter Kevin Jari to write a new screenplay. And by this time, James Jackson, Sean Daniel had become convinced that the film needed to be a big budget period piece. Enter director Stephen Summers. Uh, what year are we up to? To 96. Okay, yeah. So Wes Craven was like, he's doing his scream stuff around. Like he's probably getting that role you know he's coming out of freddy going into scream he's working on his like meta subtextual kind of talking to the audience through his movies you know this is not his gear at the moment although it would have been fun maybe in the 80s to see him try to do the mummy Mm -hmm. yeah that would have been cool but sure knows he would have nailed like the comedy horror stuff because of like the freddy comedy yeah and i can absolutely imagine some amazing like nightmare sequences if if they went that route where where evie was having like these flat flashbacks and had like of a previous life if you remember from the original mummy when um yeah helen has those like sort of like dream states i could see Wes craven knocking those out of the park but anyway we got steven summers entering the picture now at this point his real claim to fame was 1994's the jungle book the live action jungle book for uh disney i didn't even know they made another live action jungle book back in the day yeah they made well there was the animated one and there was 1994 when they did the live action all right i'm just aware of like the john Fav- and then it did like an Andy Circus one or something. But all right. He had grown up with the classic Universal Monsters and he was a huge fan, particularly of The Mummy, which he first saw when he was eight years old. 
He's been quoted as saying, Frankenstein made me sad. I always felt sorry for him. Dracula was kind of cool and sexy, but the mummy just played scared me. All right. In a 1997 meeting with Jackson Daniel, Summers described his mummy film, quote, as a kind of Indiana Jones or Jason and the Argonauts with the mummy as the creature giving the hero a hard time. And well, that's a great comparison is uh, like the Jason and the Argonauts or like those old Sinbad movies, the Ray Harryhausen stuff. Like there's a there's definitely a sequence at the end that is like fighting the skeletons, but they're mummies. And it's amazing. (laughs) Yes, I agree. At this time, Universal had been struggling, particularly with George Miller's Babe Pig in the city being a huge flop and they really needed a hit that was a flop no kidding the first one was huge i love the second one i love the aesthetic of that by the way george miller would have destroyed this movie they should have offered it to him oh my gosh (laughs) george miller like mummy in the desert so yeah universal was struggling and they really needed something some huge summer hit and as is so often the case the monsters were there to rescue them after some corporate restructuring the new studio chair stacy snyder decided to revisit some five thousand old scripts and films that universal had lying around and it was around this time that steven summers finally got that long-awaited phone call and officially pitched his romantic adventure concept with an 18-page treatment, updating the slow, shambling mummy, which had become something of a joke over the years, into something bigger, faster, and meaner. Universal loved the idea so much, they greenlit it, increased the budget, and Summers spent the next year working on the screenplay. Yeah, yeah, this this is a no brainer like if you're an executive it's one of those this guy comes into the room and he's like i basically want to do what if indiana jones fought the mummy and it's like <laughs> yeah Eureka. i'm not at all suggesting it's like a lift or a rip off because there were movies like this before indiana jones it's a genre thing but the idea to be like look we're gonna make it like an old serial from the 30s just the setting and all of this stuff just fits so perfectly in line with what they ended up doing with that franchise that if i was the executive i'd I'd be like i'm firing myself for not thinking of this so to blend that sensibilities with like modern special effects and cgi and all this it's like wow like i could i could just see the dollar signs like flashing in their eyes you know being like we got it we finally i think we finally got it oh for sure and i think about the 90s as this weird time when like movies set in this period were kind of popular you know we had the rocketeer we had the phantom and the shadow all of these like 1930s serial concepts were made in the 90s as well so it's like the 90s are a fun decade for that reason it was cool that this could fit in the modern market the way it did. like people would buy oh right cool an, an action adventure film set in like the 20s or 30s okay let's get into the casting so as steven summers is busy on that screenplay we're gonna we're gonna cast this thing we've got brendan fraser as rick o'connell of course perhaps unsurprisingly considering the turbulent nature of this entire project brendan fraser was not the original choice to play rick i'm not sure who was first approached for the role but i do know that it was offered to brad pitt matt damon Ben Affleck, and Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise, who will eventually circle back around to this very project. I wasn't expecting to hear that name. And to be honest, I don't really like anyone else they're throwing at me. Ben is best on like a spaceship. I think Matt is best just like fist fighting somebody. Brendan Fraser at the time was more of like a comic actor. This was a nice sort of step up for his career at the time, you know, to be like, all right, he can also kick a lot of ass. He's not just there making us laugh. And similarly to Indian Indiana Jones, this character, yes, he's the hero, but he's also like getting his ass beat a lot. I can't imagine Brad Pitt, Matt Damon, Ben Affleck, or Tom Cruise being okay with any of that. You know what's kind of cool is like the year before this, Gods and Monsters came out. So That's right. He's like in the family already a yep. little bit. And I wonder if he's a monster fan. I'm sure a lot of actors are because it's movies and they're classic mm-hmm. movies and stuff. But like if he lobbied for it, if he, you know, went for it, like, you know, that that's just cool that he's connected to Frankenstein and the mummy. Yes, I agree. And I think we should eventually cover gods and monsters. Yeah. So after uh, all those other guys turned down the role, either because of a lack of interest or scheduling conflicts, eyes turned to Brendan Fraser after the release and subsequent success of George of the jungle james jacks and sean daniel believed brennan fraser had the required star power to lead this project he also happened to be much cheaper than the other leading men in hollywood at the time so stephen summers he also felt fraser fit the image of the swashbuckling errol flynn type needed for the role brennan fraser as rick here is absolute perfect casting i i'm gonna say that about pretty much everybody in this movie i don't think there's a weak link in the cast he's terrific and 
I'm watching this performance and I'm like, not, I don't feel like we were robbed of, of work. I don't ever want to say that, you know, because like, I understand that he, he, he's come back recently as like an, an amazing actor again, you know, he's sort of having like yeah. another career and he's talked about kind of why he left. He, he mentioned this movie as sort of like the start of a couple of reasons, injuries and things like that. But I'm watching this movie going like, I'm looking at like the next Superman or Batman mm -hmm, or whoever mm -hmm. he wants to be at this point. It's like blank check to him as far as like, who do you want to play next? Like you play anybody. Like he has this incredible charisma that comes around every once in a while. And he just was shining so bright that maybe that was the deal. It's just like burned out. He just got burned out or something. But like, it's just, it was so much fun to watch him. His expressions, his timing is crazy. Like his line delivery is perfect. It's like the entire cast. It's like watching people dance with each other. Everybody just gels so perfectly. Yeah, definitely. Like I said, I don't think there's a weak link in this cast. The chemistry they all have with each other, it's like they've known each other since they were kids at summer camp. It's wild. And that's not the case at all for some of these actors. Considering modern day, the pinnacle of being an actor now is to get a Marvel franchise or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And to see Brendan Fraser as this guy who could have had that, do three mummy movies, and then, you know, for a variety of reasons, decide not to continue down that path, I think is pretty cool. Even the stuff before he kind of went off the grid for a while, he was almost immediately doing like other types of work. I know he was in Crash. To me, it doesn't seem like he's interested or was ever interested in being a franchise hero character for forever. I understand that too. He was starting to pivot like he was before the mummy, you know, he's just like, like careers go, you know, he, he just kept pivoting. I mean, even gods and monsters is drastically different than yep. this work, but that is closer to something like he started off with school ties. But again, it's so far from Encino man, but George of the jungle was yep. like right yep. in there. You know, I understand that it's just like, as a patron, as a viewer, I'm just looking at him. And if this Brendan Fraser, this 1999 mummy, Brendan Fraser showed up in like 2013, he would be uh, like the next iron man or whatever, or like, yep. you know, like he, he, would be running a franchise for sure if, if he if that is what he had wanted but rachel vice plays evelyn carnahan love rachel vice in this movie i mean i love her in general originally the studio had only considered american actresses for the role of evelyn but after multiple auditions rachel vice ultimately won the role apparently she's not a fan of horror movies but oh. she, she saw this one as more of a quote hokum comic book oh that's not a slight or anything like i think that's actually a very keen categorization like this is a lot of kind of pulpy comic action in here it's also believed that the name evelyn carnahan was inspired by lady evelyn carnivon the daughter of famed egyptologist lord carnivon both of whom had been present at the opening of tutankhamen's tomb in 1922 that's a deep easter egg yeah She's incredible. And like, this is probably the first thing I ever saw her in, you know, and she's done two Keanu movies. She did Chain Reaction and Constantine. She is deep into that, like heavy, dramatic kind of indie, you know, I just think she's like fantastic. She pops off the screen in this and it's again, kind of too bad. Like I wish that she, well, she did, she did Black Widow. So I guess now in her later days, she did do Constantine. Like she has some of that born legacy kind of stuff franchise stuff in her but she's not going to be around for every adventure that we're going on hunting mummies which no. is unfortunate yeah this is really early in her career relatively she's not even 30 years old when she made the mummy and she had been doing a bunch of work in the uk so chain reaction was actually like her first leading role in a movie and then the mummy made her an international star so yeah, this is real early in her career. Love her in this. And I've, and I've loved her across her career ever since this. So I think it was a great idea to not just have Brendan Fraser be the American and her be the British person, but for, but for her to have the brother too, like that's such a great touch, you know, that they're not just partners or associates or anything, but like that family bond brings so much without having to explain anything. <laughs> like, why are you helping this loser? Oh, he's my brother. Oh, okay, I get it. Yeah. After all those like dumb sort of love triangles we saw in older mummy movies, we got none of that here. And speaking of her brother, Jonathan, he's played by John Hanna. Up to this point, he was mostly known for uh, the 1994 film Four Weddings and a Funeral, was cast in the role here despite not really thinking of himself as a comedic actor. According to Stephen Summers, quote, he had 
had no idea why we cast him. Get out, dude. Because, <laughs> like he should be the doctor. He should be Doctor Who. This guy. Yeah, like, I agree. He, he's got this great British quirkiness thing going on. And, and he feels a little too early to be as kind of like uh snazzy as he is, maybe. Like I'm saying, like for the 30s or whenever this takes place. He feels like he's more from the 60s, maybe, but I still let him get away with his like confidence man act and all that kind of stuff. Sure. He and Rachel Weiss didn't really know each other at all before making this movie. Dude, that is insane. Right. They, they feel related. She was really nervous about her scenes with him because she knew him from his work in the UK. So the first time we see them together at the, the Museum of Antiquities, when he like scares her in that yeah. uh, artifact room, she smacks him in the head. They shot that scene last because they wanted the two of them to have a natural chemistry so that when we first see them together that we would buy them as a brother sister who have known each other their whole lives so she had the confidence in that moment to smack him in the head when she probably wouldn't have had that confidence at the beginning of the production very cool Arnold Vosloo plays Imhotep. I don't really know Arnold Vosloo outside of this movie. I remember being younger and confusing him with Billy Zane all the time. Yeah, I mean, two handsome, bald guys. Billy Zane was the phantom around this time. That's right. <laughs> it was a lot of fun, that movie. Arnold Vosloo is a South African actor who had previously worked with James Jacks on the 1993 John Woo film Hard Target with Jean-Claude Van Damme. Great movie as far as Van Damme movies go, but also great John Woo action stuff going on in there. I'm not sure who he plays, but I know Wilford Brimley's in that movie as a Cajun, and oh, yeah. <laughs> I guarantee it is a good time. <laughs> so Vaslu insisted on playing Imhotep totally straight, believing that for the character, this story was a, quote, skewed version of Romeo and Juliet. Mm, and okay. he was ultimately cast after a single audition. I think he's fantastic. Yeah, uh, I've seen a lot of his movies, but I couldn't really pull him out of any of them he missed his calling by not playing uh black adam like oh, a decade yeah. ago like and it's funny because the rock will show up in this franchise that's so right so <laughs> there's sort of similar looks going on but this guy on screen is so intimidating like when he becomes fully formed and fleshed out or even in the opening stuff you get uh, instantly like his appeal like he's got all the charisma he's got the body like he's an Adonis basically mm -hmm. this guy for not speaking a single word of English I mean he really doesn't speak much at all in this movie he has to do most of the heavy lifting just with his face and he can communicate so much with just a single expression it's wild did he perform like the mummy mocap when he is just pieces walking around is that him yes cool all yes. right yeah, know. he spent a lot of time on the set covered in like the dots and, and shit. And it was real weird for him because he hadn't really done anything like that before. But yeah, he did all the mocap. I'll get into a little bit of that. So not to bury the lead here, there's a lot of uh, special effects stuff to go over, but it'll sort of be a Cliff Notes version. So if you really want to dive head first into the special effects and get into the weeds there, the, the disc, the Blu-ray has like a ton of really cool stuff to, to watch. Kevin J. O'Connor plays Benny. I love this actor. I don't think I've seen him in too much. I know him from this movie. Uh, we will see him again in Van Helsing. So yeah, he's going to be Igor in Van Helsing, I believe. But I know him from, this was a great movie too. Oh, Deep, Deep Rising. Rising. Yeah. The brother or not in There Will Be Blood. I'll let you guys decide. That's right. <laughs> and I want to say he does have a role in G.I. Joe, The Rise of Cobra, which was also Stephen Summers. Oh, it's listed. He's listed on it. He's also listed, uh, speaking of Cage all night, Nick Cage, uh, he's in Peggy Sue Got Married. He's the guy that Peggy Sue goes back and like tells about the future. So yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing him again uh, as Igor. We got Oded Fair as Ardith Bay. I love this actor. Uh, again, I don't see him really uh, enough. I've, I really only know him from this. He's also popped up in uh, the Resident Evil franchise, and he is currently on Star Trek Discovery. I love seeing him on Star Trek Discovery. There's not a whole lot that I love about that series, but it's cool seeing him in it. I knew him from another movie that came out this year that I'm kind of ashamed to admit I watched a lot around this time, which is Deuce Bigelow, Male Gigolo. Oh, geez. And like, he <laughs> is like, the, he's like the male Gigolo that Deuce Bigelow steps in for while he's away. Like he's just supposed to be house sitting, but he ends up like kind of taking this guy's life. I heard that Steven Summers had originally planned to have this character like completely like head to toe covered in tattoos. But then I guess when they cast Oded Fair in the role, he just 
couldn't do that to him because he's such a handsome man. So they decided not to do that. I think it's just the right amount. Good touch. I also enjoyed the character's name is Ardith Bay, which is like yes. a, a nod to the original mummy. They fit it all in somehow. You know, it might not be the same, but they got all the elements and they're all lining up. A lot of Easter eggs, right? Not even just like lacing it on just to be there. Like, you know, like right, actually right. like making it, you know, n needed and stuff and like fleshing it out and be like, oh, let's take it this direction and like really take it in that direction. Because yes. like these guys are like, I remember watching this for the first time being like, well, whose side are they on? Like, mm -hmm. what's going on with these guys? It's like in Last Crusade where you have the guys who are protecting the grail. It's like very similar mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. You're like, well, whose side are they on? I'm not, well, they're on their own side. Jonathan Hyde plays Dr. Alan Chamberlain. He is sort of the head of the American expedition, and we'll just go through those names. Stephen Dunham plays Isaac Henderson, Corey Johnson as David Daniels, and Tuke Watkins as Bernard Burns. But we got to go back for a second to Jonathan Hyde, you know, because this guy was all over the 90s. Oh, yeah. I knew him from Jumanji. He was in uh, Richie Rich and Titanic. Titanic. Always a fun presence. He kind of reminds me of like five or six other British dudes that come to mind, you know, uh, like a lot of the Harry Potter act. Like, I feel like he yeah, should have yeah, been yeah, Harry yeah. Potter somewhere. Yeah, definitely. And uh, speaking of Titanic, we got Bernard Fox as Captain Winston Havelock. Winston's so good. I love that character. Needs his own prequel. I, I almost wonder if this was like a character from another movie that this actor was in. Yeah, I, I really just know him, I think, from Titanic and this. So I'd love to see him in some other stuff. Uh, Eric Avari plays Dr. Terrence Bay, although we don't know that at the beginning. I love him too. Also in Independence Day. Right. Well, just another great character actor. It's Stargate. And Sino Man, he was in that. Too. No, no wheezing the juice. That was the <laughs> classic line he said to Brendan Fraser. <laughs> I wonder if he walked up to Brendan Fraser on set and said, no wheezing the juice. And they <laughs> <laughs> Last uh, but not least, Venezuelan model turned actor Patricia Velasquez plays Ankh Sunaman. Okay, so now we've got our cast. Let's get into the filming. Principal photography began on May 4th, 1998, lasted 17 weeks. Originally set to shoot on location in Cairo, the unstable political conditions in the city at the time forced the production to move across North Africa to Marrakesh in Morocco. It was far less modern than Cairo, which actually made it easier to make it look like the 1920s. In fact, they even used many of the locals as extras. The production team also conducted a survey of the area so that accurate models of the statues and columns could be replicated back at Shepherd and Studios, where all the underground City of the Dead scenes were shot. All in all, these sets took about 16 weeks to build. Incredible sets. Like now everything's green screened or or we have the volume now, right? Like that right. Star Wars back lot that's just a digital screen or whatever. And it's like whatever you want, you can be on this planet. I loved that feeling of like I could walk around these sets, you could touch everything. Like I gotta do a lap and like see what's real and it was so much fun to watch. Yeah, I mean, there's plenty of CG in this. I mean, that first shot of Thebes at the very beginning. But this movie has a, a really nice blend of CGI and practical stuff. I like that they didn't just go complete CGI route because that's probably what they would do today, unfortunately. Yeah, it'll be fun to compare to when we get to Tom Cruise's Mummy and kind of be like, oh, well, like, let's see what kind of sets they built for this or let's see what they did. not I know there's like that one tremendous like airplane crash that'll be... Uh, fun to talk about other than that i don't really remember anything except for dr jekyll's library so it turns out shooting in the desert is no walk in the park oh they should have talked to george lucas and watch any documentary about a new hope yeah we went to tunisia and all of our sets got blown away and everyone got sand everywhere and it delayed everything i mean that's not all that different from what happened here in in addition to combating severe dehydration the production was also plagued with daily sandstorms and dangerous local wildlife which caused several crew members to be airlifted out to receive medical care after being bitten or stung brendan fraser famously almost died while shooting the hanging scene he kind of cited that as later being an issue for him like so if you get the disc there are several commentary tracks there is one with steven summers and the film's editor whose name escapes me at the moment but then there's one with brendan fraser by himself another one with oded fair and uh kevin j o'connor and i think another actor and so definitely worth listening to but brendan fraser gets into his version of what happened that day steven mm. summers tells his version but supposedly he was actually asphyxiating when they were shooting that hanging scene and then at some point he lost consciousness and like collapsed on the ground and had to be revived and it was like a, a whole thing which doesn't make sense if you watch the movie and it's like you could shoot it 
so like that wasn't necessary you know like hey you use a stuntman but also like you do a close-up and you have him stand on an apple card or something like that and you just you know you fake it it's a movie but like they're like no brendan like really asphyxiate yourself <laughs> he's not a stuntman and he is jumping around this movie like he is a stuntman and like i have a wonder if they're like nah you can do it like this is around the time of jackie chan but not everybody this was before tom cruise was really starting to become vocal about being a stuntman too or stunt person as well right. Like Brendan Fraser never claimed to be able to do this stuff. And yet I feel like they're kind of like saying, just do it. Well, even in that scene, there are a couple instances where you can see stunt performers and you can see that first shot where he um, falls through the trap door and the camera kind of pushes in on him. That's not him. That's his stunt double. I was watching on VHS. There's another scene where Evie is like in the library, like early on, and she's balancing on the ladder trying not to fall there's like a wide shot where it's a stunt man in drag and if you pay a close attention you can tell it's not a woman it would be funny if that was brendan fraser right if he had, like, <laughs> put a wig on him and it was like go do rachel vice's stunt the production also enlisted the support of the royal moroccan army to keep everybody safe even oh. going so far as to take out kidnapping insurance for the cast oh isn't that nice i think at that point i'd be like you know what you should have told me this before i signed the contract because i'm going back to america <laughs> right, right. <laughs> i don't not want to be kidnapped for my art as much as a lot of stuff was shot on location in Marrakesh and out in the Sahara Desert, I think the whole Hamanoptera stuff, that's all shot out in the Sahara. There was quite a bit also shot in the studio. So after they were done shooting in North Africa, the production moved back to the UK to shoot a lot of the interiors. The City of the Dead stuff, underground. Yeah, the library, I'm sure, like the um, the college or the university. And then the oh, just, about, just about all or most of the, uh, the interiors were shot in the UK on, on sets. The dockyards at Chatham are what doubled for the Giza port on the Nile River. That was actually all shot in the UK. They had to like time it and wait for a sunny day, which if you know about UK weather, not always very sunny. If you've watched some of those old Universal Monster movies, you know London can be foggy. They had to wait for a particularly sunny day so that it could look like Giza. And so this enormous set that they built, it featured a steam train, an Ajax traction engine, three cranes, an open two-horse carriage, four drawn horse carts, five dressing horses and grooms, nine pack donkeys and mules, as well as market stalls, arid clab vendors, and room for 300 costumed extras. It looked amazing. You know, this movie started reminding me a little bit of, at this point, is Peter Jackson's King Kong. Like, Peter Jackson should have watched this a couple times before making his movies because his strength is not brevity, right? Like, he likes to drag shit out forever. And this movie does, like, everything King Kong does, but, like, at the right speed. I'm not saying, like, it's speeding through anything it's not like it's going hyper fast but it's just that king kong adds like all this extra stuff in between trying to get there this movie it's two hours you know it's it's quick it's snappy it moves the action actually progresses the story and characters are changing this movie is like what i wish king kong was more like yeah, it still manages to keep all of the um, mystical stuff clear, right? We've got a lot yeah. of foreign names and words and things. Lots of characters, right? Yeah, yep. it manages to keep it all uh, like super clear and concise. So filming was completed on August 29th. In the past, we've talked a lot about our love of special effects, particularly Jack Pierce's makeup and John Fulton's visual effects work in the old monster movies. And we even praised the incredible visual effects in the 1979 Dracula in our previous episode. But now we've referred to it a bunch of times already. We're now in the age of CGI. And for The Mummy, we turn to visual effects supervisor John Burton. During his tenure at George Lucas's Industrial Light and Magic, he worked on Terminator to Judgment Day, Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, Jurassic Park, The Mummy, and lots more. Jurassic Park and Terminator 2 won Oscars for their visual effects. So this guy, pretty big deal. Those two movies in particular, like T2 and Jurassic Park, like it's, it's a miracle how well those stand up nowadays. And, and just Terminator 2 is really, for me, like the benchmark film for special effects and, and, and action. And I mean, I just love that film. And then Jurassic Park, you know, what more needs to be said about the effects of Jurassic Park? But that's to me, what was so fun about the 90s was going to the movies every month and seeing how like the special effects were getting like better and mm -hmm. better and better. And people were really starting to push like computers and see. And this is like 
you know, if you go back and you watch like Toy Story one, it's very janky, you know, and and like they really haven't gotten the the hang of their of their CGI and the characters and the whole thing. And then I guess Jar Jar comes along, and there's another sort of breakthrough. But I feel like there's a lot of the Mummy again is just like this great culmination of perfect timing for the point where we're still using a lot of great practical stuff and miniatures and sets but we're also bringing in all these touches of cgi of this new technology the disc goes a lot more in depth on the special effects here but the mummy had an effects budget of 15 million dollars and features more than 250 shots that required optical or digital special effects done largely by ilm with some help from cinesite and pacific title mirage who also did the, t- the opening titles about three months before filming started ilm began developing the look of the mummy quote we wanted to create a photorealistic corpse that was obviously not a man in a suit obviously not an animatronic and obviously alive end quote. Using a combination of black and white sketches, color treatments, and models, the designers created four distinct stages of the mummy before creating it all on a computer. For the early stages of the mummy, a team of animators literally built the character from the bones up, controlling it with a process called procedural animation to ensure a natural stretch and movement of the overlaid muscles. Motion capture was also employed to tweak the performance, and finally, the more subtle movements such as facial or hand animations all had to be done by hand. Oh, wow. So it was like mocap, but still traditional. They had to get in there and move it like frame by frame. The late stages of The Mummy were, of course, largely a combination of live action performance, prosthetics and digital effects, with Arnold Vosloo spending much of his time covered in LED lights and pieces of tape, which would serve as the tracking points for the digital cutouts, which would be added later in post-production. The sandstorms were created using a program that had initially been developed to create tornadoes for the movie Twister. So it's funny that you mentioned Twister before. And for the scarabs, they used techniques originally developed for Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. Oh, okay. There you go. Yeah, that sandstorm's amazing. The face in the sand yes. is also amazing. Like, all that stuff's really great. Um, in addition to the digital effects, the mummy also utilized a fair amount of practical effects, you know, the practical effects that we all love, including matte paintings and model miniatures, particularly in the flashback shot of the City of Thieves and the firestorm that engulfs Cairo. Most of the insects were created digitally. However, in the scenes where Evelyn is covered with rats and locusts, they used real rats and locusts. Oh, all right. Jonathan Hyde, actually, I know he specifically did a shot with locusts. They're like all over the place and he's just sitting there with the Book of the Dead in his arms and he's covered head to toe in locusts. He actually was covered in locusts, which I think is pretty funny. Good for him. Finally, the army of mummies used in the climax were created by makeup effects supervisor Nick Dudman, who created all the makeup, prosthetics, and animatronics for the film. Every suit came with its own variations for stunts or pyrotechnics. After filming and wrap, the footage was sent to ILM, where it was scanned and modeled in a computer to be touched up, mainly with parts of Imhotep's mummy to save some time, and of course, employed more motion capture to animate them. Nice. Yeah, it's cool how they use like every trick in the book, because sometimes you're like, oh, they're CG, and other times it's a guy in a suit. And it all blends, you know, because they're cutting all of it together. So it's really cool how it matches. I like that. And we do get some mummies on fire. So that's yeah, good. yes. I was gonna say at the end, sort of the, the climax when they're in Hamanoptera and they're fighting all these waves of mummies, right? The first mummies we see are Imhotep's priests, and those are actually men in suits. They were meant to be sort of a nod to the original mummies from the 30s and 40s, which I thought was really cool. And then we get Imhotep's army mummies who yeah. have like weapons and shields and things now we're getting more into like the digital effects and so there's just a nice combination of stuff going on in that sequence but that's that's all i've got for special effects the score was composed by academy award winner jerry goldsmith with orchestrations provided by alexander courage both of whom have a long history with star trek initially the mummy's title tested poorly with audiences as it basically conjured images of schlocky mummy films of the past. However, domestic marketing president Mark Schmuger said that rather than change the title, quote, we would redefine the myth with the film, end quote. Universal then spent a reported $1.6 million on a Super Bowl spot, which ultimately paid off because it completely turned around the public enthusiasm. And just to give themselves an even better chance for success, they moved the release date from May 21st to May 7th to avoid direct competition with Star Wars Episode 1. Oh, smart, smart. That's where I was. I was over there watching Star Wars. This score has some, like, amazing moments. I mean, at times it feels like Lawrence of Arabia or some classic 
Hollywood epic, it really added to the grandeur and not that it really needed it. Everything was already there. And I think of the music, I was like, wow, it just elevates it to that just extra step basically is what it does. It makes me say I have nothing to really complain about here. You know, it wouldn't be surprised me at all if Jerry Goldsmith like went back and listened to movie scores from, you know, the thirties and the forties. He's probably listening to a lot of, um, you know, Max Steiner because it does have that sort of old Hollywood feel to it. I envision the mummy being made today or like this version of the mummy being made today with a more contemporary score and kind of hating it. The score here really helps sell this idea that it's like actually happening in the 20s. It gives emotional weight to all of the things that need that emotional weight, the romantic beats, the horror beats. It gives the whole thing a legitimate sense of scope. You know, it looks like a big movie, but it also sounds like a big movie too. So yeah, Jerry Goldsmith doing an absolutely incredible job with this score. So the decision to move the release date back two weeks actually proved to be a really good decision because uh, The Mummy opened at number one at the box office in its opening weekend, grossing $43 million in 3,210 theaters, making it the ninth biggest opening of all time. But of course, it did fall to number two with the release of Star Wars a few weeks later. In all, The Mummy earned $416.4 million worldwide. I almost didn't realize it was like the same month, but people talk about the effects of Star Wars, The Phantom Menace as as like next level, like George took it there, like Uh he shot in a blue stage and put everything in after Jar Jar this and that. And it's like, well, we have everything Star Wars, The Phantom Menace had and everything before it and more, you know, like, I feel like this movie is a better barometer, something to look at to be like, this movie took the special effects. Like it's got the mocap. It's got a full on CGI character with with several of them Mm -hmm. with the mummies. Like it's got the same stuff. It just doesn't have the same name. So this is just now a personal thing. (laughs) (laughs) That's all this is. I'm just trying to air a grievance that just developed as we're recording this show like i always love star wars i love the phantom menace but like now i'm like i watched the mummy and i'm like the mummy has an edge visually mm-hmm. for sure and the way that it uses its effects and the way that it blends effects i think like george was just like i want it all done in post and like i love both things but i think i like the mummy more look you're, you're preaching to the choir i know i know but i just want to get it on record I love Star Wars. I will always have issues with episode one. I've mentioned it a couple times at the risk of harping on it too many times. The fact that this movie exercises some restraint in its digital effects and utilizes actual sets and actual props and things for the actors to interact with really makes the difference. I believe that they're actually in Cairo, traveling down the Nile or whatever. It's an old school style of of movie making. I just appreciate more. I think ultimately when everything is a digital effect, nothing is special. The film earns those moments because it's not constantly using CG. Exactly. Okay, so that's all I have note-wise for the movie. And so now I think we can get into the discussion of the movie. So it opens with pretty much the exact mummy origin that we've already seen like a hundred times it feels like. So just to sum it up, we have Imhotep, who is a high priest of the Pharaoh Seti I. And we start in 1290 BC. So we get an actual date, which is cool. And we're in the city of Thebes in Egypt. It's all pretty much the same sort of thing. Imhotep has an illicit relationship with the pharaoh's mistress, Anksunamen. When that is discovered, the pharaoh decides he's going to punish Imhotep by sentencing him and his priests to death. Mm -hmm. And so we get an incredible sequence. They all go out to um, Hamanoptera, which we know is the city of the dead. My understanding of the story is that this is sort of Imhotep's temple because he's a high priest of the dead. Right, right. I think this is sort of his home turf that's what i read into it and we get a great sequence where like all of the lesser priests are are being tortured and all being prepared for mummification imhotep of course he has his tongue cut out he's wrapped alive locked inside of his sarcophagus with all of those flesh-eating scarabs 
Yeah, this opening was, it's enormous, but like, I really love how it's extremely grand, like grandiose, but also completely streamlines the lore and everything like very well. I like the voiceover going on. The, the special effects are amazing. The camera work is great. Everything is just hitting really hard here. Uh, I love the montage that they do, the way they do it as montage. I'm getting some vibes of the way Coppola did his Dracula, like just in the sense that he was hearkening back to the older movies. I feel like they're hearkening back in this opening to like movies from the 50s that were being made, like Cleopatra or stuff like that. I love how we get the setup of his priests too, because that's where the extra mummies are going to come from. That's a great addition to all of this as well. Like the fact that we're going to get so many mummies later. And dude, this is just, it's all so violent, but so strategically directed, like for this to be PG-13, they, they get away by inferring a lot and showing a lot, but just not like showing blood, you know, cutting away at the last second. All of the ideas here are nightmare ideas, like, like yes. being, being mummified alive with scarabs eating you to death and all that. Like, it's just insane. So like this opening was great. I love the transition to modern day too. Like I was thinking like maybe that shot of the Anubis statue, I think it is like, mm -hmm. like weathering. I was like, that was probably the first shot they worked on and the last shot turned in because right. that was amazing. Great, powerful opening. Yeah, speaking to the violence and the way they were able to convey a lot of that and still keep a PG-13 rating, I was listening to Stephen Summers' commentary, specifically that shot where Imhotep is about to have his tongue cut out and then there's a wipe just before they show it. Well, he didn't make this comparison, but I'm going to make it. It's, it's very similar to the shower scene in Psycho where so much is suggested and not actually shown that the audience might think they see the real violence. Yeah, he's very creative creative with the camera and the editing here. Yeah, and he, I like how they're telling us, like, this is going to be a horror movie, too. Like, it's going to be fun, swashbuckling adventure, but, like, it's based on horror stuff. So I appreciate that they take it there in the opening. Absolutely. Also, I wanted to note that no one really knows for sure what ancient Egyptians sounded like as a language, but mm. they did go to a lot of effort to be as accurate as possible. So they did hire a linguist and oh. create a phonetic language that these actors could speak is sort of approximate what actual ancient Egyptian might have sounded like. Like this is one of those details that maybe most people would never know. You know, I certainly never suspected it. It speaks to the filmmaker's intent and their desire to create an authentic Egyptian world in which to play. I loved learning that about that particular sequence. I'm sure even in one of the old mummy movies, they were speaking some kind of gibberish using that as like an official dialect. Whereas here, I appreciate they're trying to be a is authentic at least to this world that they're building as possible and that's all going to come back later too because they're going to have to be having these characters read from different books and different like maps and stuff and so it's cool how they set you up for that later and then you know later they're not just like making it up either yes and we also get introduced to the magi in this opening sequence so in the past we're kind of used to the uh the high priests of the temple at karnak as like the protectors of the mummy but in this case they are basically the pharaoh's private secret service right like they're they're his personal bodyguards that's going to come into play later like ardith bay's character is a descendant of these ancient magi yeah, I love that addition too. It was like, they still have like the same objective as the old cult where it's like, we don't want this mummy leaving this land, but they take it a step further where it's like, we have to make sure this mummy never even wakes up. It's really cool how like generations later and uh, even probably till now in that world, like there is a group of guys carrying on this tradition. Yeah, it's really cool. Like the difference being that in the original mummy movies, these guys would use the mummy as kind of a, a weapon to exact vengeance or whatever. But here, these guys, they, they kind of start as villains. We think they're villains. And then as the story progresses, we realize, oh, no, these guys are here to put in place to protect the world from this incredible evil. Yes, it's confusing at first because the opening does a good job of you kind of being on Imhotep's side until he goes... 
but if he was ever unleashed, he would be the most powerful being on the face of the planet and like wipe everyone out. And then you're like, oh shit, like I, this guy's a bad guy. Like the, it's, he's the mummy. That's right. I forgot. Like, you know, you kind of start feeling bad for him at, at one point, but then you're like, no, we flash forward like a couple thousand years. We're Brendan Fraser's Rick O'Connell and we see Artis Bay like, and I have been protecting this to make sure that shit has not gotten too out of hand like, the right. entire time. Uh, like it's really great how there are these three sides you know because usually it's just like two sides so it's cool how it complicates things a bit yes but also is always clear right we're never confused as to who is who and it's incredible how much they were able to do with all of this and, and still keep it simple and clear and easy to mm -hmm. understand. But speaking of Brendan Fraser, that's a nice segue. Let's talk about the main character introductions. Obviously, Brendan Fraser is the hero character of this movie. We also meet Evie and her brother Jonathan in the first act of this film. We cut from Hamanoptera in... 1290 BC, and then we go all the way up to 1923 in Hamanoptera. We meet Rick O'Connell. He's an officer in the French Foreign Legion. We also meet Benny, who is a member of that squad. They're embroiled in a battle. And looking on are the Magi, kind of off in the mountainside. And this is a great sequence. Like, we don't really know what this is all about. We sort of learn later that they were there kind of seeking treasure or artifacts or whatever. But we're just kind of thrown into this battle, you know, with zero context. And Brendan Fraser gets a lot of opportunities to be a, an action hero, but also a little bit of a clown. I think that there's plenty mm -hmm. of comedy here. Great hero introduction. I think of Rick as a Han Solo type. He's got this checkered history. We don't really know a whole lot about him. We don't necessarily know he's the hero. From what I understood, the Foreign Legion were pretty badass, at least in movies. But I do... I I really love this sequence too. It's just like the action just keeps pumping up. The opening sequence wasn't so much action, but like there was a great momentum building to it. And then we cut to this, which is like a full blown action thing, like horse play, sword play, people falling off of giant platforms and stuff. Like this is a great shot of when uh, Rick and Benny are like reloading and sort of bantering. And then, but behind them, you just see like, troops falling off of buildings like one after the other like there's some amazing choreography uh really great use of of the space and the screen and like the frame and like storytelling through the action like you're saying like rick isn't just a sharp shooting badass like he is also a goofball like he also slips up but like is kind of reminds me of roger moore james bond you know where like he'll trip and slip up but like in the meantime it'll cause a chain reaction for someone or like a couple people to like get set on fire he'll like look over his shoulder like what did i just do so i really loved just how this kept building and building yeah, fantastic opening sequence. This is the scene that sort of establishes Rick's knowledge of something lurking beneath the sand in this location. So I love that it does that. I love the effect with the, the face in the sand. Yeah, that's really cool. The way the sequence ends is really unusual where he's cornered and you think they're going to shoot him, but then like everyone gets scared away because that big face comes up in the sand and yep. on all that. And so like we're reminded the mummy's down there. But, yeah, it's all just good setup. Like a lot wasn't quite sure what they were doing there in the first place either but it is just fun to be dropped in the middle of action like that having to figure out like what the hell's going on sometimes and this is one of those times yes and so after this whole scene at hamanoptera rick heads off on his own he's the only seeming surviving member of his troop and then we jump ahead three years to the museum of antiquities in cairo so now it's 1926 and we're introduced to evelyn who is a librarian and a respiring egyptologist she's there archiving right she's doing that kind of stuff we also meet her brother jonathan i love the sequence with the bookcases it's an incredible sequence. She's unsteady on the ladder, and that's funny. But then she knocks over one bookcase, which knocks over another, and then that domino effect travels all the way around the room. Fun fact, that was done in only one take. I would imagine it had <laughs> to be. There's a similar shot in 3 O'Clock High where Buddy Ravel knocks someone out in the library, and it causes like a domino effect, I think. I think that's, if my memory is right, my memory is kind of shot at this point. But I was re-watching that sequence, and I was just like, okay. Is this on a, like a motion control camera? Did they did they map this out ahead of time? Was this like planned in a computer, but like designed to be done, you know, in real life on a set? Like, because you're right, it, it's a one and done. How are you going to reset? It's like the uh, story of Everest 
on uh, Mr. Show, where like he keeps backing into all the glasses and you have to only do this once. So, I mean, congratulations. This is a great introduction to Evelyn. It shows that she's like super smart, but also a little flighty but also like responsible and wants to do more. It also tells us a lot about her character without having to like stop the movie to give exposition. When the bookcases all collapse and the yeah. curator comes out and like dresses her down for her incompetence, right? He asks why she even works there. And, it, you know, and she mentions, well, it's because she can read Egyptian and she can do all these other things. She's super smart. She's just clumsy. <laughs> I'm glad they don't play that so much for the rest of the movie that she's clump like, you know, they don't have her tripping over her feet or everything, but she leaves before she looks, which is a very endearing quality for any character to have. And like, she's got this bravado that is like kind of too big for her britches almost, which is right. great. It gets her into this trouble, but like she always fights her way out. It's also a good explanation for why she ultimately reads from the Book of the Dead and resurrects mm -hmm. Imhotep, right? She's not even thinking about consequences. Like she has the Book of the Dead in her hand. She's going to read it. It's not until she's already read all the wrong stuff that it's too late and she realizes, oh shit, I probably should have thought about this first. But yeah, she's super smart, just a little scatterbrained, a little clumsy, which makes her really fun. I love that aspect of her character because in another action movie, she could be totally flawless. She could just be sort of eye candy or a damsel in distress or whatever. Evie is like none of those things. She is getting her hands dirty. She's wicked smart. Just incredible. Yeah, that, that's part of the plot, too, is that, like, she needs more experience in the field. So, like, that's why she can't progress in her profession. This was so great where, like, her brother is introduced as, like, this uh, con man, kind of. You know, they're, like, two sides of this coin where, like, he's really good at what he does, but he's shady. And, yeah. like, she's really good at what she does. And she's on the uh, more academic side. But they have this same common interest because of, probably because of their parents. Right. I, I almost wish they were twins because I have twins niece and nephew and they kind of remind me of this duo like the way they play against each other it would have been really cool if they like just dropped like oh he's older by like a minute but i love that their sort of fates intertwine in this way where it's like she needs to get out there and he needs someone he can trust to be out there with when he shows up after scaring the shit out of her in the uh, sarcophagus he's like I've, I've actually might have found something and she's like you actually have found something you know and so like that that's really fun way to like set us off on this adventure he's a really fun counterpart to evie jonathan i love his introduction it's one of the few jump scares in this movie she hears a noise in this like other room of the museum and he like spooks her with one of the skeletons in the sarcophagus so we know he's a drinker we know he likes playing practical jokes he's going to be a fun character how john hannah didn't know that he could play a comedic role is beyond me. You know, like I said, he didn't think of himself as a comedic actor because his comedic chops here are incredible. Yeah, that came as a big surprise to me as well. Like, it just seems so effortless for him. Yeah, he's a little bit of a scoundrel and, you know, he's a little bit of a treasure seeker, but in such a way that we still like him. The opposite side of that coin is Benny. He just wants treasure for himself yeah well jonathan's a little like that he's like benny light he he's only really wants money or fame okay mm -hmm. but he's less like i'm not going to do anything nefarious with that jonathan produces what will be i guess like the MacGuffin for this movie it's that little puzzle box which evelyn is able to open and she finds the map to hamanatra in it they take it to the curator the museum curator who we don't know is ardith bay's brother i believe or um he is a bay yeah terence bay he knows exactly what it is of course and he sort of destroys the most important part of that map by accident quote unquote i like that because i forgot you know a lot about that and the way it's played is as if it could go either way like at yes. first i was like did he do that on purpose he's playing it off as oh uh, that was a big accident it got too close to the fire but then when it's revealed that he's in on it i was like oh man like that was really well done scene there if you rewatch that scene and watch him i think you can tell that he does it intentionally but the way it's cut together, that first go through, yeah, it's completely natural. You would never suspect. It's a, it's great that you can watch it multiple times and then you're like, oh yeah, all these things were pointing to the- Great misdirection like that. Absolutely. And so without the map to Hamanoptera, Evie and Jonathan have to find another way to the City of the Dead. And we discover that Jonathan lifted it from Rick, 
they don't know each other yet, but he lifted it from Rick at some point in the past three years. So Rick is at this point, the only person they know who can get them to Hamanoptera. And so they go to find him. And of course he's in prison for quote, having a good time. I love this. This whole sequence is crazy. Again, talk about like twisted stuff. Like you see the guy running on the hamster wheel and shit. And, oh, like, yeah. and then your mind just wonders about the rest of the torture going on. We can't see. But at first watching the movie, I was like, oh, he lifted this from Rick in a bar. I was like, I thought like he just did that, you know? So when we get to the prison, it looks like Rick's been in there for three years, but I'm thinking to myself, how long has he been there? It's a little vague for me. I don't know. Maybe I'm just not paying close enough attention, but I love when they show up and Brendan Fraser just like looks like a wild animal. They can't really get the information from him, but he's sentenced to death, right? We get to the, the infamous hanging sequence. So as he is sentenced to death and drops through the trap door in the gallows, now Evie is rushing to like make some sort of arrangement, some kind of deal with the warden, the prison warden for his life. Fortunately, his neck doesn't break when he goes through that trap door. And so they decide to share whatever they find with the warden. They whittle him down to like 25% of whatever they find. And so that's enough to spare Rick's life. With that deal, the four of them decide that they're going to head out to Hamanoptera together. I also love the a moment in the prison when Rick and Evie have their little like conversation, you know, and it ends with him like kissing her and being like, yes. get me out of here, lady. You know, that's when he's like, I've been there. I know it. Yeah. She's like, where did you find this? And he's like, at Hamanoptera. She's like, how? She's like, because I was there. So I guess that that answers a question as to like what the, what was going on in the opening. They were there to find secrets or artifacts or something. And like he came back with the key. So I thought that was that that was, again, nice kind of like calling back and filling in some blanks here. And now we're heading straight into act two, right? And they're getting on the boat with this awesome looking sequence here. We are introduced to some new characters on this steamer ship. First of all, I love how the Carnahan siblings are always like, oh, these lousy Americans. Or or, or they're like, oh, oh, typical American, you know, things uh -huh, like that. Uh -huh. Like that stuff is so great. And so like they're by the boat waiting for Rick and they're like, oh, late as usual, typical American, this kind of stuff. And then like he turns around, he's like, you're talking about me? And he looks like amazing. And she's like, oh, oh my gosh, like I've just fallen in love with this guy. <laughs> and we'll find out. She's still thinking about that kiss that he stole through the bars there. But so now they're on this steamer ship headed down the Nile towards Hamanoptera. And we are introduced to a sort of rival expedition. There's an American squad. Dude, these are the heroes three from Dracula, from Coppola's Dracula, right? Oh, like they, absolutely. <laughs> they just slayed Dracula and now they're off to kill the mummy. What I think is really cool really cool narrative choice is that these guys are not villains. I mean, obviously there's a rivalry there and they even make a, a, a bet, $500 bet that they'll find Hamanoptra first and, and mm -hmm. all of that. But there's nothing inherently nefarious about this group when they're could have been in, in somebody else's mummy movie i think they would have played like villains on some level yeah i agree i mean it just kind of increases the stakes in the sense of like oh there'll be a bigger body count or you know there's just going to be more conflict along the way which will lead to more fun for us to watch yes. them fight it out yeah i didn't really dawn on me when i watched it back in the day but like watching it now it's cool how many sides like here we're introduced to like yet another kind of faction of people and explorers with their own own agendas and things like that too so like it just it gets um like story-wise it's getting more complicated but it's not hard to follow by any means but it's interesting how story-wise it's still changing and we're going to get some great action on this set piece and it's still not even mummy action yet and another thing that I think is cool is that this group was introduced earlier on initially. And when mm. they cut the movie together, they decided to save them for this scene. We don't need to see them earlier than this because I love it. Okay, we're now we're introduced to these new characters. How do they know about Hamanoptera? Oh, they have a guy who says he knows where it is. And so that's a great way to like meet these new characters and then reintroduce Benny. Love that. Yeah, and these also, you need sacrifices to have the jars later. So like it's perfect they fit so many purposes here like we're going to introduce them as these sort of foils but later they're also going to be you know the jar boys that get absorbed by mummy so right, that's right. Cool too you know we get a little more rick and evelyn development here but really the point of this whole sequence is to really reintroduce the magi they know where this ship is headed they know that the map is on board that little puzzle box 
And so once everybody is sort of familiar with one another, we're reintroduced to Benny, the Magi take this ship by force. And it's a, it's a pretty harrowing scene at first. You get that guy with the hook who is absolutely terrifying. And that is our first man on fire stunt of the movie. Dude, they're going to light this whole boat on fire. I am on my feet while I'm watching this. I love this stuff. But also, like, again, they're progressing the plot because the guy, like, with the raptor claw like jumps up to evelyn and is like where's the key she's like what are you talking about what's what what key she's like she doesn't know like the object does anything correct so it's cool that amidst this action we're getting new information and awesome people on fire and everyone jumping overboard crazy gunplay there's that one where like rick's reloading and the gunshots get closer and closer and closer and she like pulls him out of the way yeah and there's another one like right th like it's just so many gags it's so much fun you mentioned Roger Moore earlier, and I think that might be the most Roger Moore gag he gets to do in this whole movie. Like, he has no idea the bullet holes are getting closer and closer, and she has to pull him out of the way just in time. I love that. It's so much fun. After everything is ablaze and, and they have to swim ashore, they're both on different sides of the river, and it turns out Rick's on the right side. So, like, they're just a little bit closer than the other team to get in there first. Benny's on the wrong side of the river, but he has all of the horses. In the next scene, Jonathan, it seems like he overpays for some camels, but once they get their camels and a, a change of clothes, which let me just point out, I mean, it's it's a major moment in the movie when Rick sees Evie in her sort of Egyptian wardrobe. It's absolutely stunning. It's the same moment she had when she saw him all cleaned up. <laughs> yeah, he has the same look on his face that she had earlier on when she saw him all cleaned up. Okay, so now like we kind of get into a travel montage. It's actually a pretty beautiful sequence. I learned that they had to shoot a lot of it early in the morning or just before sundown because when they shot at 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock or whatever, it flattened the terrain, the sunlight. Oh, the lighting? Yeah, so, so they would wait until either the morning or the early evening so that they could get that low sun to just cast all those shadows. So actually really stunning photography here. Like we've talked about how they've utilized some old school filmmaking techniques as well. The nighttime sequences were shot at like two o'clock in the afternoon and then they slapped a filter on it later. They shot day for night. So eventually the two rival groups meet up just outside of Hamanoptera. This is, yeah, one of the cooler sequences in the movie, I think, where it's this city that isn't really visible until a certain time of the day when the sun hits it just right and it suddenly becomes visible. It's like magic. Yeah, well, that's cool because it makes me think back to the opening when Imhotep and Aksunama, they're like running away and she's like, don't worry about it. You're going to resurrect me. It's all good. And she like takes her own life. Magic is a given. It exists in this world. So like they get to this point and everyone's like, what are we standing around for? And Brendan Fraser basically is like, we got to wait for like the magic sunrise for it to like open the pathway or else you could go that direction, but you'll never get there. Like it has to be this exact moment. So I thought that was fun. We're starting to like bring in more of that magical element. One of the things I love about this sequence, specifically about uh, Brendan Fraser's performance, you know, he's been here before. So mm -hmm. as everybody is watching the sun come up over the hill and Hamanoptera appear in the distance, he is the only person who is not impressed. He's been here, done this before. It's not impressive anymore. And he's just got not a bored look, but he's like, yeah, OK, you know, like seen it. And then they're just waiting to race to the city. Which Evie wins. She wins the big old race, so they get there first. And so I guess that gives them some claim at some point, but not really. They eventually are able to find a way down into the City of the Dead. They are at, sort of at the base of the statue of Isis. There's also, I don't want to skip over this scene. There's a scene with the mirrors, right? I love the mirror sequence. The sun comes down through the hole reflects off the mirror and like lights up the whole room. I feel like we've seen that gag used in other things. I feel like I've seen that in National Treasure. Yeah, because that's like a real thing. Really cool effect. But where the whole claim comes into play is when they're down like sort of at the base of the statue of Isis, which is like half buried in the sand at this point, right? So the top half is still kind of sticking out if, if memory serves and then yep. the feet are down up below. And so they know there's treasure there. They're no, there's there's something and then now the two groups are going to fight over who gets to claim that stuff 
There's a moment there where Evie discovers that the tomb goes deeper. Yeah. She sees the sand kind of going down through this crack and realizes that this is not the hill to die on. Exactly. It escalates like so fast. Like it's a it's like a quadruple standoff, right? Like everyone's got guns pointed at everyone, including Jonathan. Jonathan's like, oh, I got your back, Rick. What's cool is like it shows that like she's also got like sort of the same kind of sneaky mind that her brother has too, right? She's like, don't worry, like it's cool like there's other places to dig and this and like you know she's like rick like like, let's go to this other place you know and later like i was just thinking like everybody's turning on everybody because they already found i believe they found the book of the dead i'm not they never call it the necronomicon but it sure as hell looks like one to me that's the trade-off the american expedition finds Mm. the book of the dead and they find the little jars with organs of of Ansanamid, yeah. Evie wants the Book of the Living, right? There's two, right? There's the Book of Life and the Book of Death, and later they have to read from the other one and all this. But love how she just steals it from the dude while he's sleeping <laughs> later. <laughs> like, so funny. She really is just like her brother to an extent. Absolutely. Yeah, she's looking for the, the Book of Amun-Ra, which has a gold cover and gold pages and all of that. The Book of the Dead is completely black. So the American expedition finds the Book of the Dead and Aung San Amun's jarred remains. There's a really cool, like, old school booby trap here with, like, pressurized salt acid. Yeah. That, that like destroys the faces of these. They're not slaves. They're like locals who they've hired to help with the expedition. The one guy's like, now Americans, you might not want to open that yourself. That's why we have these guys. Right. So while they're doing that, Rick and, and Evie locate the sarcophagus of Imhotep, but they don't know who Imhotep was. There's a nice sort of air of accidental going on. Like, they're not quite sure what they're looking for, or what they're going to find, who this is. For as, as sort of with it, they are. They still, there's a lot they're not sure of. And then Benny starts to freak out on the other end because uh, he believes in superstition and he thinks the place is cursed. The warden wanders away during all this and he gets yes. attacked by the scarabs. So, like, the audience knows before they know that this place is, like, way worse than they think it is. And, like, that builds some great tension hell yeah and benny his whole self-preservation instinct is gonna come in handy for him because there's like a a curse on this box that they find that has the book in it and it has those jars and it basically says that anybody who opens it will be cursed to death if the mummy wakes up he's gonna eat your soul to gain his power back so benny leaves the room before that happens so he won't get eaten later real quick i want to talk about the warden with the scarab i love the effects in this scene it's a simple digital effect, but really great moment. And it's like right under his skin and it's like traveling up his body and you see it like bumping through his system and stuff. It's like, oh man, that's just the worst. That's more of that violence, man. Like you don't see it because it's happening inside his body, but you see his reaction and he starts screaming his head off and he runs into the room where Rick and everyone is and just kills himself, like runs into a wall, crushes his own head in. And they're like, what was that about? At the end of that day, they're all at base camp, and that's when the Magi show up. And this is their warning. Don't fuck with this. Yeah, they get into a big scuffle again, and this is some awesome writing, okay? There's no better way to... I don't know, is this like, is this considered a stalemate or a checkmate where it's like Rick's fighting with Ardeth Bay and he gets one sword out and then he knocks his gun out and then he knocks the other sword and then he does this like Rick roll and he grabs a stick of dynamite and lights it on the fire and everyone's like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> like, okay, pause. <laughs> We've sort of compared Rick to like Han Solo. I also kind of view him as like a Looney Tune character at some points. Like like just the <laughs> image of him holding a lit stick of dynamite as a weapon. It just is so goofy. But in the moment, I'm not laughing at it necessarily. No. Yeah, there's a Bugs Bunny aspect to him, I suppose. There's great moments in the movie where like the shot will start and he'll just be like posing as he's talking or like hands on his hips and like fingers sticking out or just like something. And it just all works. So like this moment was so great. I agree. With the Magi being chased off, right? I love that this is just sort of a random action sequence thrown into nothing, right? Just they just show up out of nowhere. Now it's time to settle down for the night. Evie gets plastered on uh, 12-year Glenlivet. 
which is fantastic. She kind of like spills her guts to Rick. He's like, I get your brother. And he's like, but I don't understand you. And I'm like, it's not that hard, bro. But anyway, she's like, well, my father was a brilliant archaeologist and loved Egypt and married an Egyptian lady. And that was my mom. And I, and I want to be an explorer. And then he's like, all right. I get your parents and I get your brother, but I still don't get you. I'm like, Rick. She ends up, I think, passing out. So it's the next day when everybody kind of opens up whatever they have to open up. The Americans open up that box with the Book of the Dead. Evie and Rick realize that that puzzle box is a key to open up the sarcophagus. They open up the sarcophagus, revealing the decomposed remains of Imhotep. The twisted skeletal remains and the and the claw marks on the inside of the of the sarcophagus and everything. They like put the whole story together. It's really cool. Yes. And now we're like right about halfway through this movie and we're just now seeing Imhotep, which is wild. And it's still going to take another like 10 minutes to wake him up. Like the movie is kind of split in half that way, where it's like the first hour we get to the mummy and then the second hour we're dealing with the mummy. There's been so much other fun stuff going on and really great setups and really great action sequences. And it's all been a journey to get here. So like now we're here and like I really don't feel like it disappoints at all once like the shit hits the fan. Totally. Like, I feel like I could have watched another half hour of this movie and not been bored, but they really did cut it down. There's no fat on this movie at all. Okay, now that everybody has opened up their treasure, the Americans, of course, are excited to go back to America and sell whatever they've found, not realizing that they may have just doomed everybody. And then Evie decides to steal the Book of the Dead from the guy from that other team, just out of curiosity, uses her key to open it up and starts reading from it. And then that awakens Imhotep and, and kicks us off into the second half of this movie. Yeah, It brings like all of the plagues of Egypt, which is I think is a cool thing that's one of those things that is new to a universal mummy movie i like the addition he's gonna get a lot of new powers and like uh, just a lot of powers really oh i've got some thoughts about that which i definitely want to talk about but yeah it's really cool you know what is kind of funny that i don't know if it's like intention i think it i think this is a writing thing and it's like it speaks volumes to the type of characters involved in the in the movie we're watching like in the story all right we read from the Book of the Dead. We got to get the hell out of here. And everybody wholeheartedly agrees. And ev- and, then, and then we just cut to everybody back, like, in the city, packing their shit together, <laughs> just trying to get out there as fast as possible. Like, I thought that was just, like, so funny for whatever reason. It's just, like, all that effort to get out there. And now we're immediately, we're back. We get it. We got to get out of here. But the mummy will catch up. Before they leave, we get locusts. We talked about the locusts before. Really great sequence there. Yeah, it gets in Jonathan Hyde's mouth. Oh, man, I can't even imagine sitting there with like, like just covered in locusts. And we lose one of those American guys, the guy who I wish was played by Owen Wilson, uh, right? We lose like Cowboy or something. And that's because the mummy wakes up. We get him like moving around and he steals his eyes and his tongue. Right. This is the American with the glasses. And like, that's the way to identify him because he's a handsome man, but he's wearing these like dorky glasses. And he really needs those glasses this guy is like blind as a bat this is one of those things that i might point out as being a a little bit of a plot hole right because he he steals the eyes from the nearsighted guy in the group Uh, i would have loved if gimhotep had to wear his glasses also just to be able to see it's not like he's stealing specific pieces for specific reasons it's just whoever has the jars of his beloved it's like he's just gonna take what he needs from them maybe you need like a rewrite it's not necessary but like it could have been cool if he was taking things for reasons you know like this guy saw too much so he loses his eyes the other guy like talked too much so he takes his tongue or something There really is no rhyme or reason as to why these guys have the things taken from them. Although one thing that we know for sure is that he's going to completely suck the entire life force from them. uh, Yeah. In in addition to the body parts that he may need. I like it. But do you like this concept of him like building his body back up? I thought that was, was kind of a cool, clever way to get from the shambling mummy to 
Mr. Mummy, if you take my meaning. Yeah, it's a little bit, you know, Jeepers Creepers, but I think it does it better. It sort of simplifies it and doesn't make too big a deal out of it. Like, I never question it, right? I understand that he's this old resurrected mummy and just needs life force, whatever that means. And that right. that's going to magically bring him back to full force. You know, no, I, I like it. I think it's a pretty simple concept. But again, I think this, the strength of this movie is that it, it does keep things so simple at all times. I dig it. And I think it presents some of the more horrifying sequences in the movie, right? We don't want to forget we're watching what is in some aspects a horror movie. And so when we see this guy with no eyes and no tongue who hasn't been killed yet he turns around and we see his like eyeless eye sockets the sockets and yeah. he can't speak because he doesn't have a tongue i love that i love we see the scarabs there's a scarab sequence here with like tons of scarabs we got a taste of the one in the previous sequence and now we get like this giant wave of scarabs that might be my most feared monster in the whole movie it's so small but so deadly and i just don't want it crawling through me what else is freaky the guy who loses loses his eyes and tongue benny brings the mummy back to him like he's gonna finish eating this dude and we also get our first real look at the reanimated imhotep who is mm. in his most decomposed state remember we have like about four versions of imhotep in various stages of decay or regeneration so this is his most decomposed he can speak which is cool yeah. when he first sees evie he thinks she's on mm. right which we've seen before i want to say where i think it was in the original mummy wasn't yep. Hel wasn't helen kind of like the reincarnated Anxanaman. One of my favorite scenes, remember, is when the soul goes back into her for a while, the mummy like shows her her dead corpse. That's right. Yeah, I like how they picked that up, though. Like they're going to do kind of the same thing where it's like we're going to put her soul into your body like you'll you'll be the vessel i believe they build upon this a lot in the next one as our heroes escape from the city of the dead they are once again met by the magi who are basically like look we told you not to screw around with this now we're all doomed thanks so now we got to figure out how to stop imhotep so now everybody's on the same team essentially Right, which I think is a cool way to bring everybody together. Yeah, yeah. The idea of like Art of Bay being kind of like, I didn't really do my job right. You got to help me. I really shouldn't have let you guys get away. Maybe I should have just let the dynamite go off that night. So I wanted to ask you, what did you think about the CGI mummy man walking around? He like stretches his mouth. I mostly like it a lot. I think it's a great concept and I think they almost pulled it off perfectly. But I was just curious if you had any issues with him before he gets his skin back. Overall, a lot of the CGI looks dated. You know, we're also watching it 15 years after it came out, almost 15 years. And CGI has gotten way better ever since, right? So I'm trying to watch this with 1999 eyes. Having watched a lot of the uh, bonus stuff on the disc and listened to Stephen Summers' commentary and I have a, a strong appreciation for the digital effects here. I can understand why they were like groundbreaking at the time. When I think about the scene with Benny, when he sort of takes Benny as his slave, they're in like this darkly lit little room, but there's like a fire. And they had to take Arnold Vosloo's motion capture, put that into a computer. They had to assemble the body in such a way that it had holes that you could see through it. It had all this incredible texture. And then they had to light it, you know, as if that firelight was shining on it. Yes, it looks dated watching it now, but I also really like it for the time. I think if we were to judge it based on modern digital effects they would be doing it a disservice this was like the legit shit back in 1999 yeah like watching it then i was like cool like this is really neat it's new technology i like what they're doing watching it now i almost wonder if they were just showing off like i still like it and think it's cool but we're gonna get regular men in suits later like i wondered if more of this could have been him in makeup for what it is like as far and as hard as they go with it it still integrates really well into well in the story it makes perfect sense to me but like as far as clashing with real stuff like the stuff that's really there i think it blends well enough it doesn't feel herky jerky in ways that stuff still does to this day i will say that i think that it was a smart choice to not really show the mummy this decomposed too much once he eats that first guy he's back to having skin and now it's arnold vos 
Laszlo with decomposed sections of his face or body. So now it's like a composite of digital effects with live action. And I think that that was the way to go. If you were to build an entire movie around these digital effects, it would get tired. We might be talking about it similarly to the way we were talking about The Phantom Menace and how it was over-reliant on digital effects. Unless you're going to put a guy in a suit, there's really no other way to do this level of decomposition. I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it because they use it sparingly. It looks good for what it is. But then, you know, before I know it, now it's Arnold Vosloo with some digital effects and then and then no digital effects. I, I would have liked to have seen him in his like his black ceremonial regalia a little more with that cool ass mask that he wore and all that. Like that would have been cool if he kept that on for an extra scene or two. Right. And that's the other thing is that when he's still that decomposed, they did take steps to like cover him with clothing. So I don't think that there's too much of the completely digital mummy in this. In this scene where Benny pleads for his life in that sequence, it's mostly digital mummy but then when he holds out his hand full of gold that insert shot it's a prosthetic it's not a digital hand it's a prosthetic hand and then later on there's a shot of of imhotep's hand reaching up through the sand and that was also a prosthetic so they did as much as they could with real stuff and then limited when they needed to use all out digital mummy yeah so now everybody's heading back to cairo Rick and Jonathan have decided they're going to head back and deal with this mummy and Evelyn's going to stay back. Before they do that, we meet one of the best characters in this whole movie. As they're sort of formulating this this plan about what they're going to do, we meet Captain Winston Havelock. Oh, yes. Down at basically a hotel bar. Super colorful character. Uh, this is also where we get one of the other plagues. This is where uh, everyone goes to take a shot and they all spit it out because it's turned to blood. Yeah. I wish they played up the plague stuff a little harder. I'm not really keeping track of them, but it's still cool that they're here because it's just a reminder of like, we haven't solved this yet. We definitely don't see all 10 plagues. I'm familiar with the biblical plagues of Egypt, um, and we only see some. We see the locusts, we see the blood, we see the darkness. Oh yeah, that's cool. There's only a handful shown, so we have to assume that the rest occur. The hail gives us like two or three man on fire gags for those keeping count. While Rick is heading back to his room, he runs into Evie. This is about the time Imhotep gets back to that dude whose eyes and tongue he has, sucks his soul out of his body, and is now like regenerating in their room. One of the best gags in the movie, in my opinion, is when he sees the cat. He spins into this little like sandstorm and out the window. Very cool. They should have taken that cat with them the rest of the movie. <laughs> well, the cat does come back. But yeah, I agree. They should have like had like a little carrier and just always have a cat with them. After this scene, this is when Evie discovers that her boss, the curator at the museum, is one of the Magi. And this is where they sort of learn just how serious their issue is and what they have to do to stop Imhotep. They kind of go back over the whole myth and what needs to be done. It's like a nice exposition catching up. It's a great scene that you don't get enough of that plays very naturally. Like usually these scenes are very clunky where it's like, all right, here's what we've done so far in the movie and here's what we need to do that's left in the movie. Usually it's one guy who has all the answers telling everybody what to do and then they go do it. Here we have six or seven characters all involved in the same conversation. It's more of like a round table kind of thing. So everybody gets a chance to like participate in this scene. It's like, yeah, if this was the 1932 mummy, this would be uh, Edward Van Sloan kind of telling everybody, okay, here's what we got to do. Yeah, it's really a great reveal that the bays are kind of like the good guys and they're in control and they're like working the shadows. And this one guy's even like, yeah, I work like at the uh, college and uh, keep track of all the artifacts in case someone finds something they shouldn't find. <laughs> <laughs> the plan is to find the Book of Amun-Ra, which is the only thing they can use to sort of send Imhotep back to the underworld. They found the wrong book. They found the, the Book of the Dead. So everyone's going to go back and try to find that book. They're going to lock Evie in her room. This leads to a really cool sequence, like the nighttime torch and pitchfork sequence, because yeah. every every universal monster movie needs one or feels like it's missing something when it doesn't. It starts with Jonathan Hyde's character, Dr. Chamberlain. He gets taken next. He's kind of like in this back alley with the Book of the Dead. Rick confronts Benny, trying to figure out just what the hell is going on. Benny manages to escape, and as he escapes, we see Imhotep has started to regenerate more. Now he's got more flesh, and this is where he like spits the bugs from his mouth. I love that power. It's so great to level him up like this. 
I like that idea that you don't know what else he's, he's capable of and he could turn into sand. He can, he can unleash like all of these flies and command a bunch of dead people. I like when he talks too. he's got like that echo on his voice. One thing that I really thought about while watching this is it started with Imhotep's ability to turn into a sandstorm. At some point in the movie, he can turn into sand and come through a keyhole. I think that's when he's coming for Evie. It made me think about how much we've talked about the way the 1932 mummy was similar to Dracula in the way that the story was put together. Like it has a lot of the same beats. This is the first movie that I can think of where a mummy now has like more sort of vampire abilities good call because like we know a vampire can become a mist he can turn into a wolf he can turn into a swarm of bats or whatever we've never seen a mummy be able to change shape before i love that this movie takes the mummy and its relationship to vampire mythology and just takes it a step further for this character did that occur to you at all while watching this no but i love it and like that makes total sense it makes perfect sense to me it, they're sort of like very similar powers but they're all uh desert based right you know so like he doesn't turn into mist and go through your keyhole he turns into sand and goes through your keyhole or things like that so i mean he never really turns into a dog or anything but like we don't need him to he commands stuff like that but that's really fun no i didn't it didn't occur to me i, I like that i buy that for sure before he tries to make off with Evie, he does get another member of this American team. And this is this is sort of where he he's almost completely flesh. And I only bring this up because it has one of the best gags in the movie where he sort of regenerates. A, a scarab crawls into his mouth hole in his cheek and he just like bites down on it before walking out of frame. Just love that. Things in this entire sequence are like huge too, you know, like production is popping off, right? Like there's so many, so many people, so many gags, so much going on uh, that the movie just like never really lets you rest. But like you don't also feel, feel exhausted either because it's not senseless action. We're still telling story through these sequences. Like there's locusts flying through the streets and the mummy is sucking the life force out of people and, and Rick is trying to find Evie. Part of it is that this thing is all gas, no brakes, but it's never without those moments of levity, right? So they find ways to be funny without slowing up the pace. And I think that that's an incredible feat. A lot of times the movie slows down just so you can make a joke, but here it's all kind of interwoven into the action. And so we don't have to stop for the comedy. It's all just right there, all happening at the same time. And doesn't feel overwhelming either, surprisingly. So now they realize that the book of Amon and Ra is what they need to send Imhotep back. Uh, this is all Evie. You know, she uses her Egypt know-how to figure this out. It becomes sort of a race back to Hamanoptera. But on that way, now we get, like I said, a torch and pitchfork sequence. They're fighting these people off like zombies. They all have like boils and sores and shit all over them. This is where it really becomes like almost a George Romero movie. Yeah, yeah. That's what I was thinking when you mentioned him as a potential earlier. I was like, yep. My, I mean, he's got like either the citizens or his like little mummy brigade. This sequence could be what Romero's mummy movie would have been. No, maybe it's a holdover. This movie doesn't feel like it's patchwork, but I could totally see it lifting the best moments from previous drafts. Like that makes total sense. Yeah. Like there is that kind of mishmash tonally with it that works. This is kind of the perfect venue for like a multiple rewrite project. As weird as that sounds, maybe, yeah. you know, or as something that was so stuck in development hell, like everything came out in the wash so well. It feels like he took all the best stuff from all those previous versions. And and at this point, you can't not make like a horror movie without thinking of Night of the Living Dead at some point, sometimes, you know, and so like and it, it fits with the mummy. I think when we talked about the mummy originally, we mentioned how much of a zombie he could be. So a couple things worth mentioning with this sequence narratively, the final American is consumed my favorite thing about this sequence is that Benny can't even stand to watch. He has thrown in lots with this guy and can't even watch this stuff go down. And then the heroes are sort of cornered around, well, we don't notice it right away, but they are essentially trapped in front of this manhole. Imhotep, now back to his full power, comes through the crowd and takes Evie. Well, she volunteers, right? He wants Evie so that he can resurrect Aung San Amun, but she knows that her best chance at surviving is to go with him and let the guys regroup and come get her. 
I like that twist that she's like, no, you don't have to like force me. And she has faith. It's kind of fun. It mirrors what Oxunama said earlier, where it's, she's like, she has total faith that Rick is going to get her back. Yeah. You know, when Oxunama's like, no, 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 don't worry. Like you can totally revive me. I, I believe in you. It's like that same kind of thing here. It's like, I'm going to go Rick because I know you'll come save me. <laughs> I said before that she's not really a damsel in distress. And I still believe that. I think what makes it different for Evie in this situation is that she's making the smart choice to go with him. She's not being kidnapped. You know what I mean? She knows that she's mm -hmm. not going to be dead right away and it will buy them time to come yeah. find her. There's a plan going on. Yeah. I mean, if she was a damsel in distress, it would be that hysterical just like snatching her as she's screaming the whole time uh, although i mean this might be as good a time as any to mention that like i really wish there was somehow another woman in this movie like we only get her and we get Aksunama a little bit maybe if artist bay or maybe someone else one of terrence bay's crew there was just like another presence another female presence but i understand i get it for what it's worth she she carries most of this movie on yeah. her shoulders rachel vice like she is incredible and she's like doing 10 times the work here could you envision like a michelle rodriguez type floating around in this movie totally that would have been cool like i was thinking like if the jonathan hyde character was sort of her foil where there was like an, an evil female archaeologist on the trip as well or so you know what I'm saying, or if one of the three guys was um sort of like a Annie Oakley type character or something like that, you know, that would have been fun. So now time is of the essence. They can't just lackadaisically make their way back to Hamanoptera by boat, by camel, and all that. So it is time to recruit our favorite side character here, Captain Havelock. Winston. They convince him to fly them out into that area, knowing that they may most likely die such a wonderful little sequence like we're introduced to him he's got one scene earlier he's just kind of you think he's just just sad drunk at the bar but like he comes through so hard here and i love the shot it's kind of surreal where he's just like sitting out on a dune under an umbrella next to his plane and they wander up to him he's just like drinking and listening to the phonograph and he's they're like hey uh you're ready to die you want to risk your life saving the world and he's like finally yes as they make their way out to the city of the dead with Ardith bay and and jonathan just strapped to the wings i love it Ardith bay's like this is nothing and jonathan's like oh my god i'm gonna die <laughs> so while that's going on imhotep has basically turned into a tornado and has carried benny and evelyn out there himself as a sandstorm it's okay that's so looney tunes but i love it yeah i didn't remember that i didn't remember I like that is kind of insane how they well they were just like swirling how dizzy are they they've been swirling around <laughs> in this tornado for ha like half a day i don't know how else you get them out there faster but i thought it would have been cool if he was riding on like a horse that was just like a skeleton or something you know you just you, you mummify some kind of form of transportation and it's magical so it goes faster so maybe he had like a chariot or some kind of crap but like it was just such like a you're right it's like oh there's like a twister and then like two people come flying out of it yeah. it's like that's odd <laughs> The, the money shot, or what I'm going to call the money shot of this movie, oh, yeah. it was like the big deal, I believe, in the trailers back in the day. Once the plane comes over the hill, Imhotep creates this sandstorm with his big giant face. If you're listening to this podcast and you haven't seen this scene, I don't know what to tell you. Just go watch it. This may be the most iconic sequence in the movie. Yeah, it's probably one of the most iconic shots from 1999, too. This, the 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 bullet dodge from the Matrix, um, like things like, like that. Like it's one of those shots that was just like, holy crap. What a great concept. What great execution. It makes so much sense now at this point in the movie that he can at least control the sand, right? Like he's connected to the desert. And I like the idea much more that he is not the actual sand face, but like he's down on the ground in like a trance and he's right. doing like some kind of spell or something like that to make it happen. It's so great though, when you see the biplane flying and then it just like swallows him whole uh -huh. and everything. Oh, it's so great. 
Yes, absolutely love that. And then, of course, the plane goes crashing off into a dune. She stops him by kissing him. He was like, oh, oh, okay. Yeah, she started this whole thing by kissing the hero or being kissed by the hero. And then she saves his life by kissing the villain. I actually learned something fun about this sequence when the plane goes over the dune and then it crashes. Apparently, now I I never knew this, but I never really thought about it either. It makes perfect sense that if you were to have watched this movie on a flight, there's a different edit for the film where that whole scene is basically kind of cut out or at least the suggestion of the plane crashing because I guess you can't have a scene of a plane crash in a movie on an airplane. Yeah, you can't even really have like a scene of a movie on an airplane that's in peril to like any degree really i remember i was on a plane once and the day after tomorrow the jake gyllenhaal movie where the world freezes i was watching that on a plane and there's a sequence where they're on an airplane and they like fly through a storm and there's all this heavy turbulence but while i was watching it on the plane like they just cut all that they cut all that out of the movie and then i watched it again a couple of years later i was like i don't remember oh i watched it on a plane so they cut this whole sequence Yeah, it makes you wonder why they even like show that movie at all. I question some of the choices they have on in-flight movies and for (laughs) other reasons too. Like I remember watching Inherent Vice once and I forgot about like that there's full frontal nudity in there and I'm sitting next to strangers watching Inherent Vice on a flight. Oh yeah. Well, now it's different because you can have, depending on your airplane, air, oh, now we're getting way off track, but like depending <laughs> on your airline, you can have like your personal screen in front of you. And like, I haven't flown in a while, but like they don't censor it. You can watch whatever you want. So like if you're watching Knowing by Nick Cage and you get to the scene where they have like the giant jumbo jet crash like i don't want to be next to somebody on a plane watching that (laughs) okay so now the final act of this movie all takes place pretty much underground in the city of the dead everything we've seen up to this point all kind of happens it's like a fireworks display right where you see (laughs) a little bit of this a little bit of that a little bit of this other thing and then like at the end of the show you get everything yeah the crescendo right yeah because that we've seen humans battling it out in every way imaginable and now we're gonna see humans finally fighting monsters and mummies and all that and like they're harder to kill and there's way more fun to be had fighting them we're definitely going to get several references to ray harryhausen down here during this final stretch so i'm i'm like sitting back loving the rest of this movie so we got Imhotep, who is about to prepare the ritual to bring Aung San Aman back. I don't think he's using Evie as a vessel the way we've seen in the original Mummy. He is using her life force, which will sort of transfer the spirit of Aung San Aman into her original body. The thing we haven't really mentioned either is the Well of Souls. Remember the Well of Souls? They brought that back. And you see like the veil of her essence kind of lift out of it. We saw this in the opening sequence where they only performed half of the ritual. Like you have to get the soul into a body, then kill the body for it to sort of stick and become her again. So the idea is going to be we bring her down to the Well of Souls, we perform the ritual, we get Aksunama's soul into this body, then we kill it. And that way she'll be revived as herself. I'm pretty sure that's how the ceremony works. Yeah. So while that's all going down, Rick, Jonathan, and Ardith Bay trek through the tombs. What a trio, man. How badass does uh, Ardith Bay look with a giant machine gun? He just takes it off the airplane like Rambo. He's like, this will work. That's how it made me feel. And he does kind of get shirtless, I think, for a bit. I'm glad they didn't go all Queequay with his tattoos and all that kind of shit. You know, this is way cooler. And you think he dies. Like, you think that he sacrifices himself. And I was like, oh, shit, I totally forgot he dies. Wait a well, minute. We, we sort of skipped over it, but his brother does sacrifice himself. R.I.P. Terrence Bay. He sacrifices himself to allow the rest to get through the, the sewer grate. But down here in the treasure room, which I think they say that it's um, Pharaoh Seti the First's treasures. It's like this huge, massive, like national yeah. treasure sized treasure room. It's like a vault. And we get our first taste of mummy fights. And this is where we get those men in suits. It looks so much fun. I mean, I, I can understand yeah. why they wouldn't want all the mummies in this movie to look like this, considering what they were able to do with digital effects. But to have it as like a one-off sequence where you got a couple of these guys in suits, it's just a really, really fun nod to the history of the mummy. Yeah, it feels like they're going to, want to do a little bit of everything throughout all the ages of monster cinema or movie making kind of tricks and special effects. They're doing the CGI stuff because it's new, but they're not relying 
working on it because they have to because it's the standard yet or anything like the standard is still all this practical trickery and like miniatures and suits and magic tricks and, and in-camera stuff and they're doing most of that here at the end in, in the studio I mean it blends together really well you know and especially for guys like us Dan who I feel like it's not so much about the effects it's more about the story it suits the story perfectly like this is exactly what it needed this movie needs this to kind of crescendo here in a big bombastic like you see like a fireworks display it does kind of feel like it just keeps going and going but it never gets dull and it kind of gets flashier as we go along and cooler until the end so yeah i'm right there with you the heroes find the Book of Amun-Ra. We sort of breezed over it, but Evie earlier was able to figure out that it's located under the like the statue of Horus. So they find that statue and locate the Book of Amun-Ra. And that's shortly before uh, Ardith Bey makes his quote-unquote sacrifice, or so we think. There's a moment in there that I really love, I'm sure you did too, when they're running from the first group of mummies and uh, Brendan Fraser's just like, it's time to close the door. And he like strikes a match on Ardith Bay's face to light the dynamite and then chucks it into the doorway. Dude, that was great. Dude, quickly, just speaking of Brendan Fraser too, it's like, there's so many times in this movie where like, a monster like, scream at him and he'll scream back at him. He'll be like, right back at you. Like, I love the characterization of, of Rick O'Connell. He's too brave for his britches at times, yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> but he's also so badass. Yeah, he's another one. Like, like Evie, kind of leaps before he looks. You know, I've played enough Dungeons and Dragons that I sometimes think about movies and books in D&D terms. And I feel like he's got a lot of stats and luck. And his charisma is off the charts, right? And the so. charisma, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Now that they have the Book of Amun-Ra, they have to make their way to this uh, sacrificial chamber. We've got some new mummies. These are the priests of Imhotep. They're all those guys we see screaming their heads off in the opening. Yes. And I can't tell if they are... I think they're guys in suits. I know there was an actor playing Aung San Amun next to Rachel Weiss in that sequence. They did put a woman in bandages and makeup and stuff so she could scream. And so I'm gonna assume that the other mummies in that sequence were actual guys in suits. I know that for the fighting, when Rick sword fights all of them, those were digitally created. So I think some hybrid of effects work is happening in this scene. There's that one sequence that's straight out of Jason and the Argonauts or whichever one where he's fighting the skeleton guys. And, you know, Rick is, or Brendan Fraser, I should say, is in the best way, clearly acting to nothing. Yes. And they're putting, and they're putting in them later. And it's awesome. Yes. It is definitely designed to be like noticed as an homage in that, in that way, because things are a little janky on purpose for this sequence. And like, that is so, it was so sweet to see that because it just gives me so much more kind of faith in the filmmaker being like, he knew exactly what he was doing the whole time. When they were shooting that scene, they rehearsed it a bunch and they had stunt doubles fill in for the mummies. And so the whole thing was choreographed. Brendan Fraser was able to rehearse that scene with stunt doubles. So he knew exactly what those mummies were going to be doing. And then when it came time to shoot it, he just had to remember the choreography. And then they put the mummies in after the fact. So yeah, it wasn't like he just improvised the whole scene. I was actually really impressed with the level of dedication they spent really mapping out every single beat, every mummy that was going to grab him or whatever. The fact that he had to perform that multiple times to nothing as you said and just remember it over and over is incredible as as somebody who has done some acting i don't know how he was able to do that that shot's like one of the highlights of the whole movie for me it, it feels so earned to to be like if you're with us and you see this and you know what we're referencing like that's for you i especially liked the baseball swing shout out the baseball has only been around for about 30 years at this point <laughs> we got some other great gags the disembodied hand reaching for the sword oh that's always fun when like things are still moving and alive after they're dismembered of course that final mummy that's gonna like drop uh, a tombstone or a big heavy rock on him but when rick cuts his feet off he just falls back again it's, it's more looney tunes shit but it, it's so much fun like i'm actually surprised they didn't do the bit where he unwraps a mummy and it becomes nothing right it's like maybe they thought that was a step too far but i appreciate the effort going into all these little bits Evie's still kind of in trouble. She has been unchained, but Jonathan has the Book of Amun-Ra and needs to read from it. That gives him control over uh, Imhotep's army. They don't have the key to get into the book yet, but he's able to like read from the, the cover. There's text on the cover. I love these books. 
Plus, like, there's usually just an evil book. So it's cool to have, like, a book on the other side, too. A lot of movies will just make the two books the one book. You know, the book that oh, that's resurrects right. somebody is also the book that you need to send them back. You know, it's not the most efficient storytelling, but I like the visual. I like that you have a black book and then you have this gold book. Yeah, that's what I like, too. You know, Evie eventually gets the key to the Book of Amun-Ra while Rick gets the shit beaten out of him by Imhotep. <laughs> this is good, though, because we get the face off. Like, I, yes. you know, we have Rick fighting the mummy and the mummy is kind of kicking his ass. <laughs> yeah, well, he's he's an immortal, you know, he's a god at this point. So he's able to just like throw Rick across the room like he's like yeah. a rag doll. We've seen how durable Rick is throughout the whole movie, so we know that like he's going to last a while. So she reads the correct passage from the book, which sends Imhotep's spirit back into the underworld on like this ghost chariot, which is really cool. That is wild. Because like I forgot about this like ghost chariot from beyond. <laughs> I almost thought it was like the movie ghost where like the wraiths were going to come for him. And right. it's sort of the same thing, but like the concept of the afterlife in this is so well thought out. And we only see like this little snippet of it but that they were like no like in the afterlife there's this whole process like probably based on actual egyptian kind of like ideas about the afterlife where like there's a certain person that comes in a certain thing and takes you to a certain place and like all this and like we see we see like a shot of it here <laughs> this giant chariot just comes blazing through the vault room and like grabs in hotep's soul doesn't even kill him like this is the coolest thing it just it makes him mortal now i would have left him alive and told him to go get a job you want to really suffer welcome to 1926 pal <laughs> so yeah now that he is he is mortal again all rick has to do is just impale him with his sword and he heads back into that that pool the well of souls right that's what that is i think i think i thought it was but he falls into like the the dark pool yes and he decomposes rapidly sinks down into that pool and that's it for imhotep the thing that i sort of skipped over happening all concurrently is benny has been sort of hedging his bets he knows he's on the losing team has been just like in the background grabbing as much treasure as possible and heading out and like loading up the camels and as imhotep is defeated he uh is on his way out and he accidentally triggers this trap where the ceiling starts to like come down onto the entire place Basically, he sets off another booby trap and it's going to sink the entire temple. It's like this fail safe device. <laughs> I don't know when the mummy was going to ever use this, but I guess like in the event of my complete and ultimate demise, uh, sink whatever's left into the desert forever. Or at least I think it like locks up the entire temple, you know, so you can't get in, you can't ever get out. Yeah, it's probably lost for good after this. There's an incredible sequence. Everybody is racing to get out. Benny's just kind of leaving whatever gold he had left. Sand pouring down from the ceiling. One of the best moments in this sequence, because it's it's like a re recycled joke, right? Benny is crawling through this passageway after Rick, uh, Jonathan, and Evie. The, the ceiling's coming down. And Rick, to his credit, does reach a hand out to try and grab him. But he's too late. For like, I think like the fifth time in the movie, he repeats, you know, goodbye, Benny. Yeah, and Benny, this freaks me out. Like, I got so much anxiety when the ceiling was closing in on him, and then he gets trapped inside of the vault room or the pyramid and wherever we are. It's like, all right, like, what? You're just going to starve to death. Start counting. Don't waste your air. And then the scarabs show up. And it's like, oh, God. And I love that effect with the torch. You know, it's just him and his torch. They surround him. The torch goes out. And then you just hear screams. You hear it, dude. And you hear, like, him really suffering to death. And it's, like, very unnerving. But... I got to say, couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. <laughs> so Hamanoptera, the city, everything is sort of collapsing. There's a big like explosion. And that is essentially the movie. We do get to see Ardith Bay again. He's not dead. Yeah, kind of basically wishes them well. And, uh, you know, I'll see you later. No, it was more like I never want to see you ever again. Like, never come back. <laughs> like, you have no idea how lucky we are. Goodbye forever. <laughs> and come back for the sequel. 
Ah, uh, yeah, well, definitely. I wonder if that was a deal. I wonder if that was like a thing in test screenings where they're like, oh, like bring that dude back. Like, why'd he have to die? Who knows? But it's good one way or the other that, that he shows up and like, oh, well, he was the major badass of the whole movie and, you know, after Rick. So it makes sense he survived. Rick and Evie finally have their real kiss mm. and uh, they ride off into the sunset with the gold. Lots of treasure. Lots of treasure in their camels. Yeah, that's the end of The Mummy. What a really fun ride of a movie. And uh, I mean that in the best way possible. You know, it's funny that I say that because there's a really fun theme park ride at Universal Studios. If you've never been on Revenge of the Mummy, it's super fun. Sometimes people can be a little derogatory in saying like movies are rides, right? And I'm not looking at Marvel movies, but like over the generations, people don't like blockbuster. Some people do not like the blockbuster, you know, because it's like, oh, what is it? It's just like watching a ride or like being on a, like that is part of what is awesome. Like, that's why I love Poseidon Adventure. That's why I love, you know, Earthquake and like all these crazy disaster films and stuff. It's like, I can't afford to go to Universal Studios and go on the ride. Like I could barely afford to go to the movies. Like, but I love, I love to watch it, especially when it's done this well. I feel like I'm in it. This was just so much fun to revisit. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, neither of us had really watched it recently. I'm really glad that we were able to rewatch it. Uh, I don't know that we said anything new about this one. This is like, I feel like there's a hundred, probably a hundred podcasts about this movie. But, you know, at least we were able to talk about it for a while. I know on other podcasts, sometimes it's it's difficult to talk long about stuff you like, you know, because it's just easier to kind of, you know, express what you would change with something. You know, you talk longer about a bad movie, but uh, not always. Like in this case, I feel like we did a really good job of expressing just how much we enjoyed it, what we liked about it, why we think it, it still holds up. Yeah, man. I mean, this is a good one for sure. Do you have anything else to say about The Mummy before we uh, wrap up? As much as I love it, it doesn't leave me wanting more, you know? Like, I'm kind of like, I'm good. Like, I'll rewatch this in a couple of years or whatever. I'm talking about, like, back when it first came out, you know? It's like the last thing I was thinking of was The Mummy 2. I've seen The Mummy 2. I remember enjoying it, but we just did such a great job. Like, let's move on. Like, where's The Wolfman now? Like, where's Frankenstein? I thought it was a weird play to be like we're going to keep going with the mummy series we're not going to branch out and, and introduce other monsters first as you were saying that i had pretty much the exact same thought that this should have been the beginning of a new i don't want to say like a monster universe not necessarily in the way that like marvel created their universe in the way like the dark universe was supposed to be a thing i could also really see this character like rick o'connell being in a frankenstein movie I could envision him having other adventures with these characters, but yeah, I mean, we get three mummy movies. We get like five Scorpion King movies based off of this spun off of this. It's, it's interesting. You say that about like the character of Rick. I think, I don't know if we talked about it or if I saw it somewhere else recently online, but there's something, I, I think I was talking to you about this where it was like, you just said is like, imagine if the series followed the O'Connell's and they, were our gateway into the rest of the monster verse where it's like like you said they fight they meet dr frankenstein then they meet dracula then they meet like the creature and they meet a wolfman like all that i mean and then along the way you could even do something what if jonathan got bit by the wolfman and he's you know like you could really could have built this out but that is just not the way people were thinking that's the way we think now about franchise but that was not the thinking of franchise back in the day the thinking was okay we got mummy now we do two three four or five we just go with that i had mentioned that to you that it was it's interesting to me that in in the previous mummy movies the star of those movies was the mummy and we did have a few recurring characters at one point still it was all about Karis. in this trilogy imhotep is going to show up in return of the mummy but that's it then it's scorpion king and then it's the dragon emperor this is rick o'connell's trilogy not imhotep's trilogy so it'll be interesting to watch that play out it's i think it's more what we're used to now nowadays following the hero rather than following like the character you're there to see which in this case would the mummy not the titular character he's not the star they're gonna have imhotep in the next one again scorpion king in return of the mummy as well and then tomb of the dragon emperor i've never seen i'm really excited to, to watch that one i agree with everything you said about this mummy it's super fun and i definitely want to add it to my uh regular rotation it really does hold up as a perfect movie and a highlight of the 90s 
Okay, with that, I think it's almost time for us to ride off into the sunset. But before we do, we have some monster mail. All right. So the first email we have is from Andy Martin. Hey, Dan and Mike, have you guys considered doing episodes for other pre-1960 Universal horror flicks? The Old Dark House, The Black Cat, House of Horrors, and others like those? I was just curious if you thought about them. I think that some of those titles are real gems. Love the podcast. It's been great revisiting all these old flicks with you. I grew up as a 90s kid watching all these on VHS with my dad. Universal's Monsters Classic Collection, which had a terrific trailer ahead of each VHS as well. My dad has sadly passed on but i still cherish all these monsters and look forward to sharing them with my kids when i have them thanks for helping me learn even more about them andy martin thank you andy it's funny you mentioned those tapes i i because i watched the mummy on vhs and there was an amazing trailer for re-releases of the universal monster movies on vhs I remember when the Universal Monsters had a moment in the 90s. I think there were like Happy Meal toys. There were postage stamps. Yeah, they were at Universal Studios again. Like I I did manage to get there in like 95 and I I did see them dancing around, you know, the diner or something. Yeah, I think if you wanted to see them now, you'd have to go like during Halloween Horror Nights. So yeah, let's take this one at a time here. The other pre-1960 Universal Horror Flicks, that's something that I, I would really like to do. Our focus is this particular group of characters. So our main episodes will always be like Frankenstein, the mummy, Wolfman, so on. But we have talked about doing maybe as bonus episodes, doing smaller, shorter episodes about movies like The Old Dark House and the other stuff that Universal was putting out. So yes, to answer your question, uh, yes, we have considered it and it is something that we would like to do. It's just a matter of finding the time. Yeah, some of it too is finding the movies, right? Like acquiring the movies, it can be tricky if they're out of print, if they're expensive or what have you to get those collections and all that stuff. So like, yeah, I would also like to do that stuff, but we got a lot of it on our plate. We got plenty of time. So, you know, hopefully we can get to everything. Yeah. And I mean, we've talked about all the different things we can do just with these characters. We could easily be doing this show for a really long time at the rate we do it if we stay in this track. Yeah, I think it's really it really just comes down to time. And like Mike said, some of them can be difficult to find. The, the Universal Monsters are convenient because the original movies are all collected. But once you get out of that, then it becomes a little bit more tricky and uh, more yeah. expensive to, to track everything down. I know that when we eventually get to the Hammer films, that's going to be a challenge because to my knowledge, the, you know, the Hammer horror films have never been collected all in one big box set. It can be a treasure hunt. We got to make sure that we got all of our ducks in a row before we jump in the lake i guess <laughs> yeah the, the thing to keep in mind is that you know we do this in addition to having day jobs and other things going on in our lives and we don't make any money from doing this so it's just a matter of what we're able to do at any given time we would love to talk about those movies at some point uh, so hopefully we'll get to that as far as being a 90s kid growing up with these movies you know i'm right there with you i've talked about my experience watching these as a kid it's so great hearing that you were able to share those experiences with your dad very sorry to hear that he's passed but you know those memories are replaceable right and you're always going to have those uh, like the monsters are always going to be there when you think about your dad so yeah thank you so much for writing and our next email is from connor harrington he says hi my name is connor and i'm a big fan of the podcast and i was wondering if you two would ever want to cover the 1923 rendition of hunchback of notre dame starring lon cheney it seems like recently universal has started counting it as the first universal monster movie even including it in the universal monsters halloween horror nights house it has the prototype feeling to it with a lot of similar with the other movies and i think covering it on your show would be a great way to celebrate its 100th anniversary thanks for taking the time to read this connor 100th anniversary yeah i didn't know that was coming up maybe we should do that for for a special but we've actually we almost started with that movie remember yeah. like yeah. that was going to be number one but i think we came down the line of like he wasn't a bad monster guy like he wasn't really a monster in the sense of like someone like the phantom was or, or at least they weren't trying to make a specifically monster movie to scare people with the hunchback i think yeah, we definitely had that conversation and I did consider starting with Hunchback, but I think where I fell on it personally, kind of like what you were saying is that I don't really view Quasimodo as a monster. And I think we've said this before. I, I, I definitely mentioned that the Hunchback of Notre Dame is sort of where the universal monsters were born from in that, you know, Lon Chaney did his own makeup and his ability to make himself look hideous is partially what inspired Carl Lemley to 
create the Phantom of the Opera and cast Lon Chaney. So the Hunchback of Notre Dame is sort of like the prototype for what these characters would become. But I think the reason we didn't start there was because, like you said, Mike, he's not really a scary monster. He's also not really ever included with the other characters you know you never see a universal classic monsters display and see the hunchback of notre dame he never comes back in any of the subsequent movies we actually end up getting like quite a beautiful hunchback nurse in one of the later movies if i recall correctly you know like the hunchback will come back as a feature but never like quasimodo repeating in short that's sort of why we decided to start with phantom of the opera and not hunchback of notre dame but we do agree with you that it is worth talking about and I think at some point we would really like to do it. I don't think we're going to make the 100th anniversary because it's already November and we still have some other things we want to accomplish by the end of the year. But like the movies we were talking about before, those other like pre-60s Universal movies, definitely something on the list that we would love to talk about at some point. Yeah, top of that list as well. So that is it for our emails. Sweet. Thank you to everyone who always writes the emails. I love getting the letters. Yes, I still call them letters. And it's a great way to end the show. Love it. It's one of those things that keeps me going. I'm sure I've said that before. We would do this show if we only a handful of people listen just because you know i mean i personally love reading about this stuff watching these movies again and uh, getting to talk about them but the fact that we have people listening who who enjoy what we do and uh, enjoy it so much that they they write to us it keeps my spirits up you know when i'm having a rough month like this episode was such a dog to put together i appreciate you man for for pulling through this was a big one so thank you very much for all the hard work you did behind the scenes well that's it for this episode but we will be back on friday december 29th to discuss the mummy returns we're going right back to the desert to hang out with rick and uh, evie and jonathan and ardith bay again you can follow us on x formerly known as twitter at monster made pod for as long as that remains free you know if they ever charge me to use that site we are just going to move over to blue sky where we already have an account we are monster made pod on both we're also on instagram and facebook at the monsters that made us and you can follow me pretty much everywhere at dan cologne mike where can listeners find you you can find me pretty much everywhere at the underscore mikester that's m-i-k-e-s-t-i-r and all the other shows i'm on you can find at cageclub.me and if you enjoyed this episode and you want to become a patreon supporter you can do so at patreon.com slash the monsters that made us any uh proceeds that we get through our patreon will go towards things like helping us acquire the movies that we need to do the show in addition to you know any future events me we may want to do there's a lot of stuff that i would love to do with this show it's just you know these things cost money so patreon would be the way to support us in that way you can also support the show by giving us a five star rating and review on itunes and we can't forget about our t-shirts we have a couple t-shirts in our t public store and you can find the link for that in our aforementioned twitter and instagram bios for all other things cage club related just head on over to cageclub.me that's cageclub.me we'd also like to wish you a happy and healthy holiday season We'll see you again right before the new year. Stay spooky, everybody. Mm-hmm.